All right. Well, in the interest of time, we'll get go ahead and get started. Um, thanks everyone for for joining in for day two um, of this training about the safety analysis guidebook for PD&E studies. And again, I'm Beth Wemple in Portland, Oregon. So if I keep um, uh, referencing the wrong wrong time zone, now you know why I'm on Pacific time. And Rob, say good morning. I mean, good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us. Um, so today, we're going to um, just, there's three modules today, two and a half, really. The last module is just wrap up, so it's, it's a little bit quicker. But today, we're going to talk about the predictive method and how, how that gets in, can be integrated into alternatives evaluation for PD&E work. And then we're going to talk about module six is scoping and reviewing safety anal analysis. <clears throat> and in our eyes, this is kind of a, another sort of checklist sort of module to um, help you all think about or identify what you should be thinking about as you're scoping or reviewing a safety analysis. And then we'll go ahead and wrap things up. So Let's uh, go ahead and start diving in. This module, again, is about the predictive method. Like yesterday, we're not going to be teaching the method. I mean, we'll certainly overview it and explain some of the major concepts. But um, it's we're trying to make this about what you should be thinking about as you're doing your analysis or reviewing an analysis or doing QC or something like that. So we're going to provide an overview of the method. We're going to talk through the tools and resources, um, how to start interpreting results and um, sticking with our theme, uh, documentation, what you should be documenting in the method um, so that, again, you get that re transparency and, and it's somewhat reprodu reproducible. So at the end of the day, the, the predictive method, so it's, which is part C of the Highway Safety Manual, um, Let's you estimate average crash frequency for facilities as a function of traffic volume and the roadway features. And so just for example, you could take these two cross sections on the left and right and estimate safety performance under option one over here on the left, estimate safety performance on, under option two on the right, and then compare and contrast safety performance, um, benefits and costs associated with safety, and then also how that does or how, you know, use safety then as an evaluation criteria alongside traffic operations, noise, all the other sort of normal stuff. So <clears throat> end of the day, you're estimating average crash frequency per year and you're using traffic volume, which is ADT, and then the roadway features to make these estimates. Um, so in a moment, I'm gonna run through these what I consider the sort of the four main pieces of the predictive method. But first, and perhaps true to form, we're gonna start with a Mentimeter. And the question, oops, I'm gonna get that into present mode. There we go. So I'll let you all um, sign in to Menti and add the code. And then tell us how familiar um, with the predictive method you are. Yeah, just a reminder, if you either weren't with us yesterday, or so it wouldn't be a reminder, or if you were and you forgot, it's menti.com right there at the top of the screen and that code, and you can do it on your computer, use on your phone, however is convenient. Like yesterday, we'll use it use it throughout. So, and Beth gave you some great options for this question. <laughs> the PDF does not make a great doorstop, though. I'll, I'll tell you. <laughs> I've also seen people using it for um, raising their. Uh, their computer monitors. Yes, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right, looks like it's sort of slowing down. So we've got folks who haven't used it, a handful that are sort of in equal amount who are at least familiar with the concept. We've got a handful of pros, so hopefully we'll give you some tips um, and some doorstops. Maybe for those of you that are using it as a doorstop, we can in, uh, maybe get you sufficiently intrigued to open it up. Um, and if you do open it up, and or you know, or you're completely unfamiliar with it, you know, a great place to start with it, honestly, is Chapter Three Fundamentals. That like lays the groundwork for what you should know in order to use the manual, and um, that's not very long. So anyway, there's there's yeah. my there's my plug for the manual. Yeah, I'm gonna just jump in and say, and if you if um, you know, so if you're and we did this yesterday. Who's kind of doing technical work? Who's project manager, you know, who's managing projects and all your roles. If your role is such that you wouldn't find yourself doing doing the work, it's still good to know what's in it to make sure that you're kind of asking the right questions and have the right expectations of folks. Um, and what, what are we able now to do with this method? To me, is an important thing for um, everyone to know the answer to. Oh, we can now do, we can do this. Maybe we can't do this yet. And just having an understanding so you can ask the right uh, sometimes tough questions of project teams. Good points. So um, let's talk about the predictive method. There are sort of four main things involved in the predictive method. There's the safety performance functions, so the SPFs, um, the crash modification factors, CMFs, which as I mentioned yesterday, are gonna be called adjustment factors in the second edition. There is a calibration factor, and so this is just a modification to the prediction. And then there's the empirical Bayes when appropriate. So I'm gonna talk through each of these now um, and, and hopefully kind of introduce the concepts. So these SPFs, the safety performance functions, they are specific to facility types and if it's roadway segment and intersection types. And they're, they're just regression equations developed from um, crash data and crashes in roadway and traffic volume data on specific facilities across the country. And in the manual, you'll find these equations for rural two-lane highways, rural multi-lane highways, urban and suburban arterials, and then there's freeways and ramps. And then there's um, one-way roads, right? Is in the IHSDM? Yes. Yep. Um, my, I feel like I'm overlooking something. Anyway, um, so there's there's sp these specific equations. And as I said, they're developed from research projects from across the country. And um, the output is crashes per year. And fundamentally, what you're doing is you're going to the manual and you're saying, I'm doing some work on uh, urban and suburban arterial, shown here on the right. And 3T stands for one lane in each direction with, a, with one um, two-way left turn lane. So that's my facility type. And um, here's my traffic volume. And it spits out some crashes per year. So that's kind of the basics of what you're doing. And the SPF reflects a, a base condition. Um, uh, well, let me talk a little bit more about this. So the, the S, this is what the SPFs look like. Um, here's an example for rural multi-lane divided highway. And um, uh, here's the equation for it. And so there's some variables in here. And you, you're going to go to a table in the manual, and you're going to pick up these variables and plug them into the equation. Now, in, in actuality, you're going to use a spreadsheet to do this for you. You're not going to do these lookups, but this is what's happening. There's also, for each equation in the manual, um, an over-dispersion parameter. And this will I'll talk about this more in a moment. Um, this is associated with the empirical Bayes method. And but again, there's a variable that you're gonna pick up from a table and um, 
plug into an equation and you'll use that for your k, your over dispersion parameter. And again, we'll we'll circle back to that. So um, fundamentally, you're looking up an equation for a specific roadway segment or intersection type, and there's some variables in the manual to help you do it. And so that's that's what's called your baseline prediction. So that says for rural two-lane highways, um, for example, with 12-foot lanes and eight-foot shoulders and this particular side slope and no lighting and all these different characteristics, that's a base prediction. Um, then the fact of the matter is though your facility is different from that somehow. Maybe instead of 12-foot lanes, you have 11-foot lanes. And maybe instead of paved shoulders, you have gravel shoulders. And maybe strangely, you have lighting on your rural two-lane road, whatever. So there are these adjustment factors or CMFs as they're called now that modify that base prediction to reflect your local characteristics. And so that adjusts your prediction a little bit. And these adjustment factors or CMFs as they're known now, they are different for each different um, SPF in the manual. Um, this, I'm happy to, here I'm showing the, the adjustment factors for uh, rural multi-lane undivided highway. So if your the base condition is 12 feet, but my actual condition is 11, then I would, there's, again, there's a lookup table, set of tables or equations in the manual, but spreadsheets are doing this for you. Um, there's an adjustment factor of 1.03 and so on for shoulder width and type and side slope lighting, et cetera. So again, these base conditions are specific to the safety performance function. And, um, and you are the second step in this after you've picked your safety performance function is you're applying all these adjustment factors to mod reflect your local road. Now the next step, so that's reflecting your local physical road, right? This next step is applying a calibration factor. And so this is to modify that base prediction to reflect things that can't be um, accounted for in the model. It could be, could be weather conditions, it could be the way um, crashes are reported and recorded in, in uh, California versus Florida, um, it could be driver behaviors, it could be driver demographics, but there's, you know, there's just differences. Every model requires a calibration factor. So what the calibration factor does is just modify your, your, this prediction up or down, could, it could be increasing it too, as a function of a comparison of observed crashes to predicted crashes. So the, the equation, the calibration equation really is as simple as total observed over total predicted. Um, and, and we've developed these calibration factors for other states. There's a lot that goes into it to get the database set up, but fundamentally the calibration factor is as simple as this. And for, for Florida DOT, the calibration factors are um, on the HSM, your guys' HSM webpage. So that's uh, an important, important step, right, to, to modify your local physical conditions to sort of the overall local characteristics, if you will. Now, this next step is kind of an optional one. Um, when you can, you can use the empirical Bayes method to, as we said yesterday, kind of do a weighting between your predicted crashes, those from, from this model that we just talked about, um, to observed crashes to get this, as we were calling it, this weighting of what you would actually expect for facilities like this. And you, you do that by applying the empirical Bayes method, which is sounds complicated and you know the statistics behind it, I can't, exp why it does what it does, I can't necessarily explain, but the equations are pretty simple. Um, so you're just modifying your predicted crashes um, relative to your observed crashes as a function of this weighting factor developed through the over dispersion parameter. Now it sounds like a lot, um, 
And in, again, when you're applying the spreadsheets, um, spreadsheets doing all of this for you, and you're getting your over dispersion parameter directly out of the manual. So the, the act of applying the EB is relatively easy. The, the tricky thing to keep in mind is when do I use the EB? And I'm gonna turn the slide so I don't speak over it. Um, so, so the EB is applicable since you're combining predicted and observed crashes um it's it's applicable in conditions where you wouldn't expect observed crashes to change a lot from over time so so it's really valuable in under an existing conditions um, um, scenario or maybe a network screening scenario where you're trying to identify locations that might need safety improvements um, because you're you're looking at you're predicting crashes on your existing facility. You can use observed crashes from the existing facility to develop that blending and get that rig more rigorous expected crashes. So you can use it when you have safety performance function and a, and a calibration factor. You have observed crashes. And the roadway geometry and traffic control are not changing very much between the no-build and the alternatives. So we'll talk about that more. Um, and the alignment isn't changing much because again, you're relying on observed crashes as, as part of your weighting. And if the system's changing a whole lot, you wouldn't expect observed crashes to stay the same. So the empirical Bayes method can't be used or shouldn't be used if there's a substantial change in the system, um, if you don't have a calibration factor. Um, so if there's a new alignment, you're not going to be using EB. If you're widening a project that changes the typical section dramatically, again, where you wouldn't expect observed crashes to stay the same, you're not going to use it. If you're changing an intersection with the number of legs or the type of control, you're not going to use it. So um, the question is, when are you using it? Well, you're definitely using it. You can be definitely using it um, in existing conditions. I'll say the potential for safety improvement in case you haven't recognized a theme um, or in, in a network screening exercise. So this takes us to another, um, another question, which I didn't need to do that. I needed to do this, uh, which is doing this. So, Select all methods that apply. So identify the situations where the EB is applicable. And I, I'm gonna read it just in case you're having a hard time reading it. It's, uh, the left is converting yeah. a two lane rural road to a four lane rural multi-lane highway and changing a four leg always stop control to a signalized intersection. Middle one is widening the shoulder of a two lane rural highway from six to eight feet and adding an HOT lane to both directions of a freeway. And then there's the none and all categories. None of these, all of these. And I think, Beth, as we talk this through, there may be an added level of complexity that, you know, uh, you're asking kind of the surface question and there may be, um, mm. there may be another way to interpret this question and answer it differently. Just think it out loud here. <laughs> well, that's interesting. I haven't, I haven't seen the complexity yet, so you'll have to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> Well, in, when we laid out the question, we definitely thought widening the shoulder. But Rob, why don't you tell me what you're what you're well, saying? So, no, yeah, so on the surface, I think that to me, that's that's the answer. And, and as you were talking before, I was just reminded of prior discussions about this and, and writing the manual and everything that EB 
um, doesn't have a lot of applicability to right. a typical PD&E study or project because usually what we're doing is something uh, more substantial um, and you know it's not you know so but it so clearly does apply to a shoulder widening project um, but you look at some of the others changing a two-lane rural road to a four-lane rural multi-lane highway that's a completely new type of facility and and so the crashes, the historic crashes are not going to be a good indicator of the type of crashes you're going to have on this new four lane highway because they were related to the two lane road. However, you could use EB to prove that the need for upgrading that two lane rural highway. So it could still be part of your project, but it would not be part of your comparison of the alternatives. So it could be so part then, of your right. evaluation right. of historic. Right. Yeah. So then, so then the first and second and third would all be applicable. But I'm not sure about the freeway, right? Because I'm not sure how I would model that. Yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, maybe not the, maybe not the third one. And, and I guess it's pretty important for us to be clear and point out. So um, unless you're using it for PSI and historical analysis, you absolutely cannot, you should not use it for one, two, or four for a future comparison to modify right. predictive because the crashes on the road for the last five years are not going to be a good indication of future crashes once you've made these fairly substantial improvements. That just, um, I'm going to say what I always, I remind, it makes me think of all the statements that you hear if you're, you know, future. What is it? Past performance is not an indicator of future future performance, and companies will say that in their in their things. And, and it's true with crashes that if you make a big change, then it's not going to be a good indicator. If you're not making a big change, it actually, in this case, is a good indicator. Sorry, I had to have a few things to say. So nope. Most of the slides here until the break are all yours. So I, I <laughs> <laughs> no good good additions. I was just going to ask Adam. Are there, if there are any, any questions? Um, so there was a, just the two quick questions, I guess, about this example, oh. but um, uh, the, uh, one question was just about converting from the second thing, converting always stop to signalized. I think Robbie mm -hmm. mentioned it, but the crash types and things like that would differ. Um, yeah. I don't know if you want to expand on that anymore, but. Um, just the trends would change. And then uh, then the second question was, uh, doesn't widening the shoulder change the typical section? It, uh, it, it does, but it's not like changing if, if we were just, I mean, I don't know how often one would just add two feet of shoulder width from six to eight, but let's say that's happening. You we wouldn't expect a sub substantively different um, safety performance in terms of the types of crashes that would occur. So the, we would, I would argue that the historic crashes are, would likely stay, likely be comparable in the, to the future condition. And, 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 and the, these, um, adjustment factor that you would use for the two feet would account for the change. Right. So you would actually, That's one true. of the factors in the equation would change, but you could still use the, the uh, historical data to kind of, um, you know, move it up or move it down is basically right. what you're doing based on how people are driving that road. Other right. factors that you know, yeah, accounted for. So you still would get the change though with the adjustment factor. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's kind of the key. You guys have said it already, but just to reiterate, like it's, it, it is primarily when things are not changing, but it's in the, the theme of how crashes are likely and safety performance is likely happening in that area or at the intersection. So if we think that it's a little subjective because of that, but if you think that it's not going to change, you could potentially use EB. Right. Exactly. Right. Yep. And, and since I asked Adam if there were any questions, I, re, I am reminded that Adam asked me to say at the beginning, what I didn't say is that we wanted to let folks know that the slides will be available. And also we're gonna go through the questions after the um, session. And if, if uh, 
we're, we're going to respond to all the questions and we're going to get those out too. So um, if we don't get to your question, we'll, we might in the in the follow up. So uh, let's see. We have those four ish steps, right? We have find our SPF, find our adjustment factors, use apply the calibration factor, and if EB is applicable, go ahead and use it. Um, all of that relies on developing like these homogeneous units of analysis. And in the HSM world, that's everyone calls it segmentation. So there's this process you do of um, taking a look at your facility and dividing it into uniform um, analysis units, uniform segments. And um, at, the, at the broadest level, you have intersection and segment crashes. So that's like the first big um, uh, separation you make. And then for segment crashes, then there's for each safety performance function, there are there are different um, cross-sectional features that influence this segmentation. So number of lanes, shoulder type and width, median type and width, access density, all these things um, influence what your, your homogeneous unit of analysis is. And um, again, different facility types have these different features. So, so for example, on an undivided multi-lane highway, these are the characteristics that influence segmentation. Um, and in urban and suburban arterial, these are the, the factors that influence selection of, of the SPF. So, so you're, this is, the segmentation step really is the, a very, very fundamental and um, critical piece of estimating your outcomes because every every unit or every all of the um, analysis builds on identifying facility types and then selecting safety performance function, adjustment factors, et cetera, et cetera. So that segment segmentation piece is super important. Um, and different softwares, um, uh, if you use the integrated highway safety design model, IHSDM, it's great. It does segmentation for you. Um, it becomes more of a black box, but it, um, it's a great sort of analysis or data management tool. Uh, if you use the spreadsheets, you you have to do the segmentation yourself. So it's an important step. So at the end of the day, um, what do you get? You you get some predictions, um, and so you, it can be presented in a table or a graph. But fundamentally, as 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 we see on the left. For your analysis years, maybe there's a um, current year and 20 year future year, you can predict fatal and injury crashes, PDO and total crashes, and you have that for your no build and your build condition. And then um, you can do the comparisons and, con and compare and contrast results. So these are all, this is predicted crashes. Um, so at best, you've applied the safety performance function, the adjustment factors, and a calibration factor. Um, if there's not a calibration factor, then you've just applied the SPFs and adjustment factors. And then I might argue that you should just report a ch the change in crash frequency as a percentage rather than a number, but um, something to think about. Now we've, we've mocked up, um, you know, an analysis to show that crashes go down with with our build condition. And and we do see that, but we also see that crashes go up with your build condition. And that can that can happen because often with your build condition, traffic goes up. And traffic volume um, is the most um, has the greatest influence on the crash prediction. So when when crashes do go up with your prediction, you got to start looking at maybe looking at rates and seeing how that what that does to your results. Um, maybe crashes go up and there is a mitigation that we should think about from a safety perspective. Um, so the results aren't always as as clean as this. So how do we get through all of this? Um, a lot of steps, and and I am going to try and use. I'm not going to try and use. I'm not going to do it. Um, 
So fundamentally, you've got to figure out your data needs. You do this segmentation, which as I said, is the most critical step because um, this is identifying which equations you're going to apply to which pieces of your network. Um, and uh, then you would apply the safety performance functions, apply the adjustment factors, apply the calibration factor, and predict crashes. Now, as I mentioned, depending on the software that you're using, um, at a minimum, applying these factors and getting predicted crashes, and even the EB, if it's appropriate, these are done in the software. So you don't have to, you're not going to the manual and looking up these equations. Um, if you use IHSDM, that model will do the segmentation for you. But as I said, it gets kind of black boxy. Um, so then you would do this for every year of your analysis. And this is something to, to keep in mind when we do a traffic operations analysis, you know, you'll do your build year, your opening year and 20 years forward, um, and then compare and contrast. Well, when you do safety analysis, you do opening year and then each year up to your design year, or your 20 years forward, because crashes unfortunately are occurring every year. Um, and that's, that's an important thing to remember, particularly if you're gonna do a benefit cost analysis. Um, so once you've repeated steps per year, and again, the software is set up to do that for you, um, you get your outcome of predicted or expe expected crashes per year and then your totals. Um, and depending on the models you're applying, you get that by, um, you can get that by severity level as well. And if you're doing arterials, you can get pedestrian and bicycle crashes. So that's kind of the method in a nutshell. Now that's, um, uh, you know, that's that's a skimming across the top to give you the concept. If you diving into the depth could be a whole nother course in and of itself. And and while it's um, you know while it's a valuable tool to help us, there are of course limitations that that we need to be aware of, right? And so um, you got to account for calibration because of variability in driver population and weather. Um, something that is super important is we're doing um, we're doing 24 hour predictions, right? And particularly in urban areas, um, that's not accounting for variations in daily flow and peak periods and the differences in traffic operations and probably crashes as a function of, of the peak periods. The freeway model accounts for this with a factor, but um, there, so that's not accounted for. Um, and then there, there are, are a lot of facility types or um, um, I see that we didn't finish a sentence here, um, or innovative intersection types that, that aren't accounted for. Um, uh, you know, DDIs, there are some CMFs now, but they're not in the predictive method. Um, the right now, the freeway method is limited to five lanes in each direction. Um, that is maybe only marginally useful in Florida. Um, I've done projects in California where it's almost never useful. Um, and right now, HOV and HOT lanes aren't included, though there's some research that should be coming out this year about that. So it, it helps, it's the best available, and it, with all things, it's, it's not gonna be always our solution, and we're gonna have to sort of cobble things together as we talked about a little bit yesterday. So that's, that's the predictive method in a nutshell. Now, we do have a break scheduled. I don't know if we wanna just keep going, Rob, or... Um, we can keep going. Yeah, let's keep going. We can keep going out in that after. Way, in that case, you're up. Yeah, yeah, I will have to give me a second to, to get uh, get my presentation up, but um, it won't take long. All right, you should be and able I, to share. While, yeah, while I'm, uh, thank you, while I'm doing that, I'm going to just say that, uh, yeah, you mentioned the um, percent versus absolute, and that um, that's a pretty important uh, thing to 
to think through and, and make sure that can be used to overcome some of what you were just talking about. Um, if you have a situation where the predictions, you know they're in the right direction, but you just don't know the magnitude, you know, you, you're not, you don't have confidence that the magnitude of the crash predictions you're coming up with are, are uh, what they need to, you know, are accurate for your facility. Um, that's where sometimes you you go with just percentages. So we're we yeah. based on the information we're we're we have um, a level of confidence that we're going to decrease crashes or that this would increase crashes by x to y percent. You know this range of percentage increase or decrease, um, and that can uh, help work help you work through some of the limitations. Um, so Beth, I'll make sure you see. Uh, See yep. my screen. All right. Yep. I w okay. before you get guarded, started, I'm sort of scanning questions too, um, and I just somebody asked a couple things that we can address real quickly. Maybe you did already, sure. Adam. I don't know. Um, when is the second edition of the manual coming out? It um, it's a year or two away. We don't know for sure yet. We're HDR is is on the team to develop the second edition, and um, it, at a minimum, it's a year away, but depending on the additional work, um, it could be two years away. And then somebody asked if EB is the same as PSI, and I don't, Adam, again, if you address this, I apologize for being redundant, but um, it, it is not. You use EB in order to be able to apply the PSI. And so um, the PSI is the difference between the expected prediction and the predicted prediction um, and so that, that's that just wanted to clarify that yeah we said uh, I did reply to that one uh, oh, good okay I said almost the same thing as you um, the other thing I was I pointed out was the uh, the time difference the PSI is for something that would have already happened you're evaluating historically uh, past events whereas EB you're typically looking and the predictive, you're typically looking to the future. Yeah. You don't have yeah. to, but yeah. Right. Right. All right. Okay. Sorry about that. No, no, no. It's good. We're away. good. And, and we will get into, um, so I just, for everyone, uh, we're going to get into more complexities as we go through the rest of this predictive kind of session and discussion there. You know, it's, uh, there are things to think about and, and then ways to kind of work around things to get to uh, uh, good and reasonable answers, but it, and it does surface sometimes some important safety issues. When you, you know, it, it surfaces important safety issues we need to be thinking about. So I, I'm gonna go through an example, um, widening a two lane highway to a divided four lane highway. I'm gonna let you know that some of the material that we are uh, gonna be presenting uh, today, just like yesterday, comes out of the guidebook. So I just wanted to kind of flash a picture of the guidebook up here that um, is available to all of you, available online right now. You can, you can, if you don't have it, you can go get it, download it. Um, and uh, it has, uh, you know, good information there. And then I, you know, Beth referred to the calibration factors. Those are in the uh, 2015 um, manual, uh, HSM user guide. So, and those are, you know, available to all all of you, I just wanted you to know that, so we're pulling from from uh, documents that that are there for all of us to use. So uh, this example, we got a, a two lane highway that uh, is proposed to be widened to a divided four lane highway. Uh, a lot of, you know, traffic demands. And so maybe traffic uh, is the first, uh, you know, the reason that this project has been uh, has surfaced and uh, you've got this BDE study to, to look at this. And so the um, first thing that you want to do is kind of size size up. How are we going to uh, tackle this project? And so there's a scoping, which we're going to talk um, in the next module about kind of scoping from a slightly different perspective. But here we want to scope out what we're going to do for the predictive method. Um, and we want to define that study area. And we want to, and I am going to uh, at risk of uh, trouble here. Um, we, we want to define the study area and, yeah, I got to change color. Bold, Blue. bold, Rob. 
Yeah, I know. I need I need bold. I don't know how to get it to be wider. No, no, so you're bold. Works. You're bold to try it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm bold. Yeah. So I, actually, I, I use the the highlighter. So so yeah. So this is you know work through the study area, and then uh, and then your analysis years. And Beth just talked about this that uh, with the the um, spreadsheets you you get one year of analysis and so you can do here we are doing 2022 and 2042 and that lines up with what the traffic operations team on this project is doing they're going to do you know an opening year and a future design year and there so we want to align um, but often for what we report we want all the intervening years and especially if we do a benefit cost then both the safety folks and the traffic operations folks have to provide all the intervening year data as well um, and you can use linear interpolation i would just say that that is not with safety that isn't necessarily an exact um an exact number uh, if you linearly interpolate the crashes because the safety performance functions are curves and so things do not um it's not a line a straight line between the two endpoints but um, that is an approximation that could be used. Uh, um, when you use the um, tools, like Beth mentioned IHSDM, when you use some tools, it will do all of the calculations and so it will linearly interpolate the volumes um, or you can put in volumes and then um, you get a kind of a more exact set of numbers. So just, you wanna define that at, at the outset. What are the, our years? Are we doing intervening years or not? And, uh, and that is, um, again, a change from what the traffic operations folks are often doing when they might be looking at endpoints. And so you need, you need that to, to think about the middle potentially. And it also makes it easier to report results um, so that especially for the high severity crashes, you've got numbers that folk, you know, folks can kind of understand um, and you're not dealing uh, constantly in, in decimals of crashes. So again, looking at a longer time period kind of helps get things into whole numbers. Um, so that's analysis years, roadway type. In this case, we've got a rural two lane, rural four lane divided. Uh, there's codes that apply, and then that defines the safety performance function. And then here, what are the tools we're gonna, we're gonna use? And so we've shared some, we're gonna um, actually share some others later today. This is uh, the, um, the spreadsheets, the, the FDOT modified HSM spreadsheets. And then we've got our segment length, our forecasted uh, informa traffic information, and then our calibration factors. And you'll notice uh, Beth talked about often the build it will involve a higher traffic volume. And so that's the case here. We're, we're predicting that on opening day, it'll be the same, but by the end of the time, time horizon, the volume will be different. And sometimes they're much different. And that, um, and we'll actually do something with that later, later on in, uh, in session today. So, so Rob, I'm going to interrupt yeah, you before, before you change slides. So this table um, I think could be a really useful table in, in a scoping memo, right? Where at the end of the day, this kind of summarizes some of the major assumptions that you would be doing in, in your analysis. And it, you could also, for example, yesterday we talked about where you know, if there, if our, let's say a, our traffic volume exceeds the limits of a model, um, you could have that ca caveat expressed around this table or in this table. And, you know, from a documentation perspective up front, we could all go, okay, these are the numbers we all agreed to. And because um, again, this really influence drives your results of <laughs> what equations we're using. And as Rob will demonstrate in a moment, the calibration factors that we're using, these really influence our results. So just wanted to put the, point that out. Yeah, no, excellent. And again, this is in, in the manual. If you're like, you know, for, if you want to look at examples, it's in the manual. And, all right, so data. Uh, there is quite a bit of data that goes into these models. We are not going to go over all of this data. And when we do the examples later today, we've already put it into the models. So you won't have to enter in all of this data, um, but uh, there is um, a good bit of information and it matches, like Beth said, for each model, there's specific pieces of information that are required. So for these, um, for this base model, the, this two lane model, we need to know the um, lane width and the shoulder width. 
and we need to know about horizontal curvature and important characteristics that will um, allow us to get a, uh, a good prediction for uh, the, the no-build condition you know, roadway. So you enter all of this information in and it will, uh, um, it's necessary to, to get, get the prediction. Then for the build, um, this, uh, the, the build model requires fewer inputs in this particular case, um, but it has, again, lane width, shoulder width, shoulder tight, um, the side slopes again, and, uh, and so the various factors that are required for this type of, of highway are entered into the model. And so at that point, you've kind of laid out your, uh, your, your assumptions, your process, how you're gonna do this, you've got your data, and the data goes into the model. And so this is uh, basically the, the uh, screenshots of the model that uh, show that where the data goes into the model. And again, we're not gonna go through each one of these in a lot of detail, but I just wanna show you, goes in and you can see that just the things that change, change once you've got something set up, it can be pretty easy to, uh, to replicate it. Um, this is now the uh, real multi-lane sheet with the data. And then I'll point out, it's got that calibration factor. The other one had a calibration factor of one. This has a calibration factor of 0.68. And so that means that your prediction is going to be reduced to 68% of, of what it otherwise would have been. All right, and then, these and I, these are the um, CMS that will in the future be adjustment factors. They will be AFs in the future, but right now they're still shown as CMS. And th this, if you even if you're not doing this, so someone else did all that other work. They got all the data. They put it into the model, you, and you should check and ask. Ask the question: you know, What are the major CMS? And if you know something should be influencing the crashes, you want to highlight that. And so. Right here, you can see that um, the shoulder width here on the left and the driveway density, they're moving the needle and they're causing us to have a higher number of crashes than other, um, other two lane you know, rural roads. Uh, and you wanna make sure that, that, that this rings true, that this is in fact what you expected. Um, the, that's on segment one, and we divided the segment based on shoulder width, and you can see that that plays out, the shoulder width for the second segment where it went from four to eight. The eight foot has the, the wider, you know, the wider shoulder has a lower CMF. And, um, and so, but it's got a curve, and the curve shows up, and that, so you wanna kinda understand enough, or at least make sure that someone on your team is understanding that this is doing what we expected it to do, and that we're getting, um, the right the right answers out and don't let it just be that black box so so that's you, you don't have to look at all of them but you just you do want to know you know here it really is driveway density on the first one and, and the shoulder and then the second one it's that curve do we get the curve in there right it's a 15 you know, 14 percent uh, change in crashes and so that is uh, to me a pretty um, pretty important thing to to do so the second one uh, we don't, the CMFs are pretty, pretty modest. We don't have a lot of changes or AFs, I should call them. You know, they're, so we're going to be pretty close to the, to the base. What's going to change the number here is what I showed you before, that calibration factor. Okay, so, so I guess what I'm trying to say is as you go through this, make sure you know what the, the, the needle movers are. What, are. what is changing from the base so that you've got it, you make sure you've got it. It's telling the right story here. Um, so we get to this. Uh, yeah, this is the calibration, the point, uh, point six eight that uh, that I mentioned, and um, and that's an that's an important factor here. Okay, and so the, I'm falling through the steps that Beth just showed you with the boxes generally, but now we uh, we've gone through, we've entered the data, we've done our prediction, we've checked our calibration factors, and now we've uh, um, yeah we've done our done the the calibration piece, and now we're to the end. And so before I go into the end, I will just say, Beth, anything to add or, or Adam, any questions thus far that we wanna, before I dive into the numbers here? I'm not gonna dive in, but before I start talking about the results. It's, uh... Well, from my perspective, if you go back a slide to, or a couple of slides to looking at the CMFs, um, like the, when you, when you, yeah, this one in particular, when you're working in the spreadsheets, these are kind of in the middle, so it would be it would be easy to look past them and just go to your results. Um, right. But 
you know, like anything, like anything when we're doing our, our analysis, right, we want to understand what Rob said is like, what's moving the needle and does it make sense? And in particular, if, you know, we get a, a situation where the crash has increased, um, we want to be able to look at these CMFs and go, well, what's, what's driving things the most and is there a situation where I can do some mitigation? Or, um, you know, if I can't mitigate the the those highlighted in peach or salmon or whatever color that is, maybe there is something I can do elsewhere that will um, offset those increases. So just just um, yeah, giving just, that uh, another think, shout out. Yeah. So the, the, I mean, the data goes in at the top, and this is. Uh, and then you got the CMFs all right here. And so they're, you know, they're not, you don't, you just don't want to, they're, they're all embedded. They're all done for you. All the calculations, if they're equations or lookup tables, it's all done for you. And, but you can kind of go here and look and see, and these are the ones you see right there, the 0 0.93, 1, 1 1.14. So you just want to kind of go and find those and make sure that uh, that's from the example yesterday. This is again from the book. So, okay. Um, yeah, good. Good point, Beth. Go ahead and go to the results. So the results. Um, again, we got two analysis years, uh, and we've broken out our crashes by segment one, segment two, and then the, the total um, for no build to kind of know how the segment, you know, how the crashes are are uh, playing out in each segment, and then we've got the build, and then we've got a crash reduction. We're showing a pretty um, pretty good reduction here, and uh, that is, uh, and, but we broke it out by severity. Uh, you can see that the reduction is uh, larger for the property damage only crashes. And that is something that you want to pay attention to is, is the change by severity. Um, as there are cases, you'll see later today, when the one might go up and one might go down. And, uh, and you've changed something where um, the, those safety performance functions uh, for um, very specific, a lot of them are developed separately for severe uh, crashes, you know, the fatal and, and, and injury crashes for, uh, compared to the property damage only crashes. And so that separation is pretty important and is valuable and useful to us uh, as we do our work to make sure that we aren't uh, mistakenly reducing total crashes, but increasing severe crashes. And so you want to pay attention to that as you go through and look at your results and start to kind of sift through, um, like Beth said, what you, if you need to do any follow-up um, or propose, you know, propose anything back to the project team. So, so that is really the, uh, the end of that kind of quick example. We're going to do another example together. Um, Rob, I had a quick question. Yeah. I think other people might ask um, if you go back to this slide. So two questions, I guess, uh, one being uh, the accuracy um, or quality oh, of the results. Yeah. So yep. what what is, you know, like you're showing a lot of percent change here. Um, what is a threat, is there a threshold or an accuracy level of number of crashes or anything okay. like that? Well, I'd start with, yeah, I'm showing here one decimal place, and Beth and I were talking about this a couple of days back of um, that there are a couple of schools of thought. One would be to keep everything to whole numbers of crashes. Um, when you're looking at a single year in a short segment, that the rounding errors start to be an issue and the ability to understand what's going on. So that, that can be problematic. You can solve that um, by showing a, a decimal, which also, which also shows that it's in fact a calculation. Um, it's not as, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a calculated number. Um, so you can use that one decimal to show that. You can also uh, change it to show all of the, to show additional years. And if you show a 20 year time period, all of these um, would move into the, uh, clearly into the whole number category. You can start to work with numbers that um, folks are more comfortable with. And uh, it depends on your audience. So for this presentation, this audience, I'm, I'm showing you these uh, to one decimal. Uh, if, I, if this was a public presentation on this project, uh, I might decide to show the 20 years and not show any decimals so that, that the public isn't um, 
I'm confused by that. How, how can I have a half of a crash? So, so, so your audience is important as you're thinking through some of that. Um, so those, that's part of the answer. Um, Beth, did you have more to add? I mean, well, I'll say. Yeah, okay. no, I mean, I think, um, I think what you just said, particularly the audience, um, is really important. And I think definitely when you talk about these numbers, talk about the results, it's, um, you know, I wind up talking about whole numbers and saying, oh, it's around two, you know, that right. difference and, or converting it to some average per year that people can relate to. Um, right. Yeah. So, so, so Adam, the other part of your, of the question, at least what I heard you say is, um, these are, you know, maybe the word approximately needs to be put in there. And these, these are, we're not certain of these, these, num these numbers are based on distributions and and yeah. so um so that's where yeah you could round those percentages as well uh and report for example we think crashes will go down by you know a, a rounded percentage um you know maybe it's uh, 25 to 30 percent for fatal injury and 65 to 70 you know or you can put you can put some some uh right some rounding and, and some ranges on these numbers um, to show that uh, we have a, uh, we th but they're good numbers, they're based on the best information we have, but um, but they are not that exact. Right, so, and from, from a sort of a detailed technical perspective, there there's sort of regularly, regularly there's discussion among the researchers in the Highway Safety Manual and at TRB about providing these standard error to these equations just like there are with the cmfs so that we can talk about that range right so so that is yeah those are excellent questions things to to consider think about as you're deciding again based on your audience whether or not you know what kind of information you show and and uh putting brackets on i would say these numbers are substantial enough that i think we can say this will this this you know in this scenario we're going to we expect to reduce crashes if it's it's you know we predict the crashes will go down um maybe the magnitude is not exactly what we're showing here but it's um it's not an increase it appears to be a decrease so so you got you know at some level you can start to draw conclusions especially when the numbers are um like this so all right I'm gonna go on to the next slide uh, unless Adam was there one other, or was that it? You said um, there. There was a question before. There, there are some others, but um, about blending methods. We talked about this yesterday a little bit. So, uh, just correct me if I'm wrong. I guess here, but if if you had a different CMF that wasn't didn't interact with the ones that are being applied in these equations, I could then at this stage, once I have all the totals, apply a CMF. An additional CMF, for example. Yeah. Yeah. So if if you needed to blend to analysis types because the CMFs aren't in these spreadsheets, right. um, you could do that here. But there is a, a a caution due to the fact that some of these equations might have some bleed through uh, right. affecting the CMF. Right. So. Yeah. So I I'm I just flipped to actually I'm gonna flip to the four lane four lane multi lane highway and um yeah if there's so if there's something that's not accounted for here um with shoulder type and medium width and you know you've done there's some kind of treatment um and uh you know that, that we're going to apply that isn't isn't addressed here that's completely independent then yeah you could apply it at this point and it's kind of like the ddi example that we did yesterday i mean the DDI. It's a, it's a CMF after you've done your prediction. All right. Good questions. All right. The uh, predictive method tools and resources. So I mentioned now uh, yesterday and again today the uh, F.HSM HSM spreadsheets. Uh, there are also uh, on the other side here the national uh, 1738 spreadsheets. Those have uh, gone, been updated a little bit and they've been cleaned up a little bit. Um, they, they look better and they, they're easier to, yeah, easier to work with now. Um, uh, 
they didn't change any of the underlying equations. There was one little mathematical cleanup in one of the sheets um, that was affecting decimals of crashes. They fixed, I believe, um, but generally those should be uh, the same. There's kind of different uh, different spreadsheets that do the same thing. Um, then in Florida, we also have um, SPICE and then we have the Florida specific calibration factors that we've talked about. So um, we've got a variety of Florida specific tools and um, things to, to think about. And then the, the national side, uh, ISID, IHSDM are for uh, freeways. Uh, well, ISID is for freeways, ramps and ramp terminals. IHSDM is for all types of um, roadways that for which we currently have safety performance functions. And so I'll say Beth mentioned one way and then there's six lane arterials have been added to the kind of repertoire of safety performance functions and they are only in IHSDM. And so if you want to do calculations for those types of facilities, um, I think roundabouts uh, also. So I think they are think only in IHSDM. Yeah. And so you you can't use, there's no spreadsheets for it. Uh, at least I, I don't have any. <laughs> and there's no, um, you know, there's no, I think you have to use that tool. Um, so that is just something to keep in mind. Again, as you're picking tools and you're scoping out your project, if you know you have a one-way um, one way road that you're gonna need to, to evaluate, you're gonna have to use IHSDM to evaluate at least that piece of road. You can you can mix and match, um, but uh, because the, you know, the equations are, are the same, just some tools can do certain things and some can't. So, um, so things to, definitely things to think about as you're uh, entering into a project and scoping it out and making sure that you're not gonna get caught um, later on having to switch things up. Uh, that they don't, they don't really, they don't, they don't talk. You can't copy from one to the other. So, so Beth, I think that's it uh, from me right now. I pass it back to you. All right. If there are questions about any of those tools or you want more discussion of, about that, just let me know. We can bring that up later if you've got any specific questions. So we got a, a few little summary slides and some Mentimeter and then we'll take a quick break. Um, so documentation, again, it's an important piece of what we do in pd and &E, um, and in the safety world. Um, so, you know, the, the safety work should be included in the project traffic report. Um, I, you know, I, I, I am seeing this evolve from a section of the study to an actual chapter. So that's, that's good to see. Um, and these are the kinds of things that we document, right? The study area, the period, the alternatives, the data, the methods, the tools. So essentially, kind of if you think back to that table Rob showed um, at the beginning, you know, we're, we're looking to um, transparently document what we've done. So if it had to be repeated, it could be, or somebody can use their judgment and go, yeah, that, I, I agree. Um, and then, the results, when you get to that point, the evaluation, it should show how the safety goals are being addressed or the safety purpose and need, perhaps we should have said, is being addressed or how um, what we're doing is not having substantive negative impacts. And then you wanna be able to compare and contrast results across alternatives. So similar to any other work we're doing, it's document and then evaluate. Um, and then this is sort of a repeat of, of what, what we've been trying to present, right? For there's, there's the existing analysis and then the future analysis. And that existing helps us define um, should, should safety be a, a specific need and the purpose and need? And should we be proactively thinking about it? Yes or no? And no is okay. No is good, right? We're, um, and, and if yes, then we better speak to that in our documentation. Um, and then the future analysis are the evaluation of our, of our alternatives, which is so hard for me to say. Um, we've got various tools. We can use crash modification factors with a relative comparison where you're just applying CMFs, or we can apply CMFs to observed crashes. Um, as we were just talking about, you could also apply CMFs to a prediction. Um, and then we can use the predictive method. Um, 
So the safety performance one, just use the SPF. If we have a calibration factor, apply that. Um, and if we can, go all the way and use EB in order to to um, estimate uh, sort of re-estimate observed conditions. So a lot of tools are available, and um, the the guidebook sort of provides an overview to these options. And then there's of course lots of other resources about how to how to actually learn and do. So we've got a Mentimeter. Let's see if I can. Um, Okay, so we'd like you to select the four main elements of the predictive method. And so down here we've got CRFs, adjustment factors, AFs, SPFs, safety performance functions, calibration factors, DDIs, EB, the PSI. I'm not as uh, tough as Rob. I go ahead and show it right away. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll see if we can get a couple more responses. Yeah, thanks to everybody who's participating in this part of it. It's just good to. So yeah. It's, out there. Fundamentally, it's the adjustment factors, the safety performance functions, calibration factors, and at times the EB, the empirical Bayes method, and um, and then you know obviously there's that segmentation step that's a critical piece of this. Uh, the next question is, does F dot have SPF calibration factors? It's a little bit hypnotic to watch these change. <laughs> so I'm gonna let it hit hit 70 and then All right. The short answer is yes, they do. Um, it's on the F dot HSM webpage, if I'm not mistaken. Rob, I think you showed it earlier. Yeah, it's in, in the 2015 F dot Highway Safety Manual User Guide has has them in there. But yeah, you can go to the webpage there, um, and we're going to talk more about them later because they, you know, there's, um, you know, there's discussion, just ongoing discussion about them and. And the use of them, but yeah, that's where they are. Um, is the EB method applicable to the PD and E process? Yes, always, no, never, maybe if they're small facility changes. So this this has that same complexity that we didn't think about when we were writing the question, Rob. <laughs> so I just answered. This is the first question I, I hadn't answered any questions. That's your head. I'd answer. 
<laughs> so when we wrote the question, we were thinking maybe if there are small facility changes, but um, there's also the, the, you can use the EB to apply the PSI method to determine if safety should be a primary purpose and need. So maybe that falls into still maybe, or maybe that falls into yes always. I'm not sure, but that's the uh, that's the complexity we didn't anticipate when we wrote the question. So so it will it will be um, for a lot of projects. It won't apply to the alternatives analysis. Right, right. It, it'll right. be it'll be a limited number for alternatives analysis, but it'll be uh, invaluable for your historic work. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for clarifying. No, it's. I'm just repeating, not clarifying. <laughs> okay, and that that is it for um, Mentimeter right now. So I think that takes us to a break, um, yeah. which means I need to get my slide back up. And, and I um, will say before we go on break, when we come back, we're going to start with case study number four, and then we're going to roll right into case study number five. So. Um, hopefully you all have, there are three files for each of those case studies, so hopefully you have those six files. If you do not have those six files, please um, go into the uh, chat questions and, and type, uh, give Adam your email and he can uh, send them to you. Hopefully you all received them, most of you seem to have them yesterday, but uh, those will be pretty important um, for the next part of the, of the class. So. Uh, so, um, welcome back, everybody. Hopefully, uh, yeah, got a good little break here. We're going to dive in on this case study number four, like I said before. Um, and I'm going to ask that um, Adam and Beth, as we're going through this, uh, you know, this this case study is a little bit more involved. And please, uh, please chime in as we go. I am uh, just have one little technical question, Adam. Can you see, or Beth, can you see me? Because uh, my camera thing isn't working on the side. Can you see me okay? Oh, no. Yeah, we can see you fine. Yes. All right. So I can't see myself, but that's, I don't need to. Um, okay. So, excellent. So case study number four, arterial example. We've um, got an uh, urban condition uh, where we've got a, uh, um, a couple miles of road, a little over three miles of road that uh, currently has a center two-way left turn lane and they got a pd &E project. We're looking at uh, converting it to a raised median, at least that's the concept on the table. And uh, so there are a variety of reasons, you know, we're kind of pursuing this project and we've been asked as a team to evaluate uh, the, uh, to predict safety performance if we make this change. So, so this kind of gives you the, the layout. There are two separate segments and there are two intersections involved in the project. Um, and uh, go to the next sheet. It's got that same general table that we showed you before that lays out the scope and methods. So again, this is a good way, like, like Beth said, to, to kind of clearly outline how you're going to tackle, tackle the project. So here, um, we've got uh, the study area is uh, a little over three miles in length. And so we've got, you know, this, this study area here, three miles, and then analysis years, 2020 and 2040. We're gonna use the urban five lane with two way left turn lane, the 5T for doing the no build and urban four lane, 4D for the build. And then we've also got two intersections. So unlike the prior one, now we've got to call out the intersections. One's a three-legged intersection, one's four-legged, they're both signalized. And so the build, no build, SPFs are actually the same. Um, and the assumption here is that we're not, you know, there's turn lane, the turn lanes that are there are there in the build and in the no build, so no difference. Um, so we, we kind of work through and, and pick uh, the, the, uh, the SPFs, the tools, the Got segment length again and then our forecasted volumes down down here and so in this particular case um, at this point we've we are assuming the volumes to be to be the same so that lays out the uh, 
the situation. And now let's go ahead and um, yeah, dive into uh, initial steps. Um, the uh, no build alternative, we're gonna open the files in just a minute here and review the no build file. And then we're gonna actually transfer, transfer some uh, summary results into a summary worksheet that you were provided with. And for the build, we're gonna do the same thing, look at the file, transfer a few key pieces of information into the summary worksheet. And I'm gonna pull them up. And so I'll do it on my screen. Encourage you to kind of work along with me to, to understand the sheet and what we're, what we're doing. Um, Cause we're gonna, there's gonna be a, a next step to this. So it'd be good if you just kind of do it on your own and um, while I do it on the screen. But so go ahead and open up the three case study files. The names are here on the screen, no build 2025, HSM build 2025 and the crash summary worksheet, all for uh, CS4. So the no build, let me get the right file here. All right, so the no build sheet looks like this. And uh, got the introduction tab on the far left. And then segment one. Uh, we've entered have kind of the, the red box is not is not normally there. I drew that. So just to draw your attention to the fact that you know, we've entered the data. That's the that's the uh, the data has been input into the sheet already for segment number one. We've got the volume, got number of driveways, all the information has been entered. And uh, again, this is this relates to uh, an example in the, the workbook if you want to look back at it. And segment two, same thing enter the information and uh, we're going to be able to get a crash prediction and and uh, again for uh, reference the CMFs are uh, you know are down below and you can investigate those and and see kind of how they uh, how they factor in so yeah so for example lighting we've got lighting and so we have the CMF uh, 0.94 for lighting all right then intersection number one just kind of working across here we've got the data entered there and we've got the uh, AADT for the main street, the side street. We've put in the calibration factor. So I'm gonna zoom in so you can kind of see that a little bit better. Gone ahead and put in the, uh, the main street traffic, side street traffic, the calibration factor. So it's all, it's all in there. And um, importantly down here, you'll see there's uh, left turn uh, phasing information. And so for signals, there are a number of kind of specific um, uh, items that are important to predicting crashes at signalized intersections, including turn phasing, the presence and absence of turn lanes, presence or absence of protected permitted phasing. All right, and then uh, intersection number two, same thing, I've entered that information. Um, so this all ties back to things Beth has been saying about the, uh, the ADT, ADT and make sure that you know, you, you need, um, again, for the, uh, some of this, we need a little bit different information than maybe um, the operations folks need. We want those daily volumes at these intersections. Okay, so now we go to the urban site total. So it is uh, tab number eight, uh, if you, from left, and it's the urban site total tab, and it provides a summary of the crashes um, by type of crash and segment and type of crash and intersection. It also provides a summary of the bicycle and pedestrian crashes. And so this uh, is one place you can go. There are some of this information is also available at the bottom of the sheets we just looked at. It's also available on another tab, which is the project total. But right now let's just focus on this urban site total sheet which I've got the, the boxes kind of drawing attention to the, the key output information. And this little table off on the right is not in the spreadsheet. If you go and download it from a website, um, I've added that so that I've done a quick summary of the um, key pieces of information for the fatal and injury and property damage only crashes for intersections and segments. So this is a quick summary of the no build predicted crashes um that uses all the things best talked about the um the safety performance function the adjustment factors calibration factors At the end of the day these are the numbers that that we get 
And so what we're going to do is take those four numbers and we're going to put them into this summary um, crash summary worksheet. So we get the crash summary worksheet and I've got a, there's a place, the yellow highlighted cells, um, give you a place to put the no build crashes on the left here. And so we'll go ahead and do that. I'm going to just pull it off my screen to do a quick copy. And I am doing it right along with you. Um, and so we get a number of uh, a number of crashes for our no build, and then uh, we also calculate rates uh, at the bottom part of this table. So we've got numbers of crashes. It does the the totals um, by severity and totals um, by facility type, and then the total um, for our, all crashes. And then down below, we've provided the uh, the information necessary to get exposure so that we can calculate rates. And we talked yesterday about how to calculate rates. And so that uh, information is uh, is here and gives us a starting point. These are our no-build crashes and our no-build crash rates. All right, so I will just uh, pause, say, um, Adam, any questions before I move on to the build? Nope. Okay, just making sure. So let's go ahead and pull the build file over and we're gonna do the, the same thing and uh, go through it a little bit more quickly as the, the information is uh, pretty similar. Um, we've entered it, but you see here that in uh, row nine, if I zoom in, we've got uh, the 4D. We've switched from the 5T to the 4D, um, four lane divided. And so we've done that in both tabs and then we've got our intersections and they are unchanged. And then we go to the urban site total. We've got the same information there. So you can kind of look around, um, see that, that uh, the information has been changed for the build condition. Um, and really that's the, the biggest change is to pick a different SPF in this particular case. Um, all right, and then we're gonna go ahead and copy the four summary numbers again um, into our into our workbook. So we'll go ahead and paste those in. I'm gonna say one other thing here. So about, uh, about so I've pasted them in, but before I kind of go there, I do wanna just draw your attention. We're, we are using columns D, E, and F, which are the predicted numbers. We did not put the observed crashes in column G in either of these spreadsheets. Um, so we're not using empirical bays, so we are not getting an expected average crash frequency. We are working with prediction, you know, predictions, <laughs> predicted numbers. And that's a, that wording um, that we keep, you keep, you hear us using is, is uh, very specific to the HSM. So it's predicted um, is what we're using because we, we, uh, we can't do expected without using the empirical bays and we are changing the road and we we think enough in this case that we wouldn't use empirical bays so we've made that kind of project team decision that we think the crash types are going to change once we get this raised median in place um so could discuss it debate it but but that's the assumption made here and and so we can't we're not using eb and um but we are still going to get um a compare a very comparable set of numbers uh, for these two scenarios. Um, they, we've got good predictions, got good information, and uh, everything's in the ranges. So this is uh, kind of a good use of all of the tools that we have available to us. So so we, we put we those have, numbers and in. And we have calibration factors. And we have calibration factors, right, exactly. Yeah, so we put the, we put the numbers in and, um, and we have a reduction in crashes. Um, our reduction is, uh, We've got almost a crash a year again. I left these as one one decimal here. Um, Carl, could you zoom in a little bit? Absolutely. On, on the sheet, and maybe if you could just really quickly uh, highlight again where you grab these numbers on the on the worksheets. Someone yeah. just was asking to go a little slower, and I, I think maybe that's yeah. the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. That's why I was asking before because I, I knew I went a little quicker the second time around. So. Uh, it's the urban site total tab is where you can get the summary numbers. Um, and the, I've embedded this little table in here that does the summary for you. Normally, you would have to go do this yourself. 
and you'd have to pull the numbers out um, and say, I, you know, I want. Um, and so I'll just explain that a little bit more that column uh, D is total predicted crashes. Column Maybe even make this a little bit bigger too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Column D is total predicted crashes. Column E is uh, fatal and injury predicted crashes. And column F is PDO crashes. And then it's separated top half by roadway segments and then the bottom half for intersection, for intersections. Yep, yep. so the, the top, top part is, uh, is segments and um, we've got multi, vehicle non-driveway, single vehicle, multi-vehicle, driveway related crashes. So there's three kind of sets of calculations that are that the spreadsheet is doing for each uh, roadway segment. So this is a question yesterday and today, but um, if you have this project is fits in the default spreadsheet setup, but if I had a project with five segments, I would just need to copy the tabs and yes. then reference them in. The first two are referenced, like if Rob, if you could click in D14, you'll see it'll show that it's a probably a reference to another cell in the workbook. Um, so yeah. if you add other segments, you copy the tabs, and then you'd need to reference them in here uh, manually. Yeah, so yeah, one of the uh, um, changes that was made in the Ashto spreadsheets is that they now have, I think it's ten, it's eight or ten. I think it's ten segments. And intersections oh, okay and it's all um set up to automatically reference there's some macros and stuff that that automatically reference it makes it a little bit easier to do exactly what you're just saying so yep so you want yeah, and that's, to go ahead oh i was just gonna add that's a reason if you're using the hsm the ashto hsm spreadsheets um and for that matter, Florida is, it's probably best to sort of always download them as a starting point rather than to pull something from your files because um, chances are there, there could be some updates that would be beneficial. Yeah. Yeah, my, if I can, maybe later I'll show the, the Ashto one and show it's got uh, a little bit more functionality. That's one of the things that they did was added more functionality from this initial, this is the, uh, initial work um, built by Karen Dixon and and um, yeah so they've, they've been kind of been trying to keep upgrading so so we've got the information here um, on the segments and intersections and again it is important to know that the pedestrian information is kept separate those are calculated in a slightly different way and so the numbers end up being uh, pulled out and you need to make sure that that whatever you're looking at you've got them uh, all added together. So if you use this particular tab to do your your work, you'll need to add um, add them back in. And they are all assumed to be fatal and injury. There are no PDO uh, ped bike crashes. That's just the the way it's that is the way it is calculated right now. So all right. So with that information, I'll yeah go back here. So we've calculated out of that site totals uh, tab. The two sets of numbers and then this uh, this is just an example um, and you can you can summarize this data in a lot of different ways there's a lot of other information this is um, uh, for some projects this would be more complicated than you need and for some this would be too simple <laughs> but this is a, a way for us to um, at least get our arms around it for this specific project so we want crashes we want crash rates we kind of want to know what's happening at the intersections versus the segments and severity so it gives us for this type of project, I think enough information to start to uh, uh, see where this analysis is, is leading us. Uh, when you get into more complex projects, uh, sometimes you might need to have um, more segmentation. You might even break out, I, I, you know, for example, did not break out single vehicle versus multi-vehicle. Um, and I, you know, that just, different projects you need to think about it in different in different ways and do different things and sometimes there's post-processing here we don't have any post-processing we need to do to those numbers for cms or anything so um so we get it in here though we get these these sets of numbers um 
and th this is not an un you know this this could be a real project it's not unreasonable for it to be um this level of complexity but not more um you know sometimes it's less again sometimes it's more sometimes this is about about right so here we uh we go ahead and we calculate the change in crashes for fatal and injury. That's really one of the first things for me that I would look at is what's happening with my fatal and injury crashes. I'm interested in the bottom line number. I made that bold, bold the bottom line, I guess. But, but honestly, that's really where I look uh, to see if I, you know, the direction this project is headed for safety is, um, is fatal and injury. It's so all look there. Here, it's, it's good. 7% uh, reduction. Uh, property damage, 5% reduction. So we're doing better with fatal and injury um, than overall 6% reduction, um, about two a little over two crashes a year. And then down here, our intersection rates stay exactly the same. We did not change anything on those intersection tabs. So the intersection crashes are actually identical. Um, but the, the, so the segment crashes is where all the change is. And that's what we would expect. And we've got a reduction in crash rates of uh, you know 10% for fatal and injury and 8% uh, overall, so it looks looks good. I mean, this this is a benefit. Now, it, I say it looks good, but this is not this is an expensive project. We're gonna you know potentially we need you know it's it's gonna have some uh, the public will be very interested in this project, right? We're changing access, so so this gives you the tools to begin to look at if you. If um, if you need to uh, benefit cost and you know, what are what are the the benefits of this uh, for safety? So that uh, gets us to the first step. Um, Adam, if there are no questions, I want to move on to back to the presentation for the next step. Um, if we have time, there there are a few questions. I'll try to summarize down to two or three here. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. Um, so one question was about, uh, I think this is a good question just in general, if we're doing this type of analysis, then do we need to do a historical crash analysis for a project? Okay, uh, so I, the short answer I would say is yes. Uh, you want, yeah, I mean, yes, you need to do that historical to uh, demonstrate that there's a need, um, a need for the, uh, uh, whether or not there, let me rephrase that, whether or not there is a need uh, for safety to be um, part of your purpose and need. And if it is, then, then you know that you need to try to address it with your project. So if you did the safety analysis and it showed a significant safety issue and you run these numbers, um, you're showing a benefit, but then you could ask yourself, well, is this enough of a benefit? And if you ran these numbers and it showed a decrease and safety was part of your purpose and need because you'd identified an issue, well then you need to we need to change our change our build alternatives to address that purpose and need. So to me, um, the historical analysis is really essential every time. It, it, the level you can adjust how much you're doing. It might it might be. Uh, and not as in depth because you might be able to very quickly identify that it is not an issue or that it is a uh, is an issue so that you might not have to go the, the depth of that analysis can vary but I, I think it needs to be a part of every project for pdme yeah i completely agree it's in the depth of the analysis you may not slice and dice by all the different factors for all the different scenario all the you know throughout right. the study area but it's understanding, again, should safety be in the purpose and need? And if not, are there any trends that we need to address in our project nonetheless? Right. Okay, Adam, others? Um, yeah, there's another question here, which I think other people might uh, have a similar question, but uh, the the different driveway types. So on the input spreadsheet, there were, it's asking about commercial driveways, residential driveways, et cetera. Right. right. Um, so how do they impact the number of crashes? And how important is it to get those correct? I guess I'm adding on to the question, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, 
I would say that it is um, it is important to consider that and to get in there. I mean, I guess you know, I'm hesitant to say it's it's it is important to pay attention to it. Um, you know, if we look down here, they you can sometimes do a sensitivity analysis and see right. if it if it's going to move the needle i mean if you know the difference between 20 and 25 may not be significant for um you know for for example minor residential driveways um that's just not gonna change things really substantially um and and so if you are uh again uh thinking about the scaling your your efforts you might just make an assumption there again document it you know, we, this is my documented assumption. This is what I assumed, um, and uh, and kind of keep keep moving. Um, but I we typically do fill the and we fill those all in. We will make um, sometimes we'll make estimates. You know, these you see these are all rounded to the nearest five. That <laughs> that's not uncommon. You know, we will round. We'll, we'll get numbers to the nearest. You know, we're kind of this is the order of magnitude and uh and should work for this analysis yeah i agree with rob and taking a look at how how sensitive you know what's the range of the cmf as a function of my numbers will also tell you right how how refined i need to be right just looking to see yeah um yeah we maybe Come back to that. Go ahead, Adam. Uh, next one. Good. Just gonna try to do a sensitivity. What's the uh, next question? Oh, um, sorry, I was trying to re reply to some as well. <laughs> I think this would be a question that you answer later. Uh, but what if some crashes go up and some crashes go down of different severities? Okay. Yeah, that's. So with that question, let's press on to the next the next one, and if we can, we can circle back on. Um, I can maybe even demonstrate the sensitivity analysis. But um, let's see. I go ahead and pull back up the uh, presentation here. Uh, so actually, yeah, I've got a couple of millimeters. Um, so we've already talked some about this, but I'm going to go ahead and and uh, put these up on the screen here real quick. Um, the What are the initial results? What are the initial results uh, indicate? And this is kind of open. This is open response. So, um, just uh, you know, if you again put yourself in the shoes, this is your project. You know, and I just handed that analysis to you. You know, what what do you what what do you uh, what do you draw from that? And and from some, yeah, from different answers, you might think, uh, you know, maybe we need to do something more. Maybe this isn't enough for this project. Um, and I, I do look at it and I wonder, is that going to justify, you know, if safety is the reason we're doing this? Am I convinced or not convinced at this point? All right, so let's see. Okay. Good, small safety benefit, safety improvement, decrease um, benefit. I saw one about the uh, fatal injury there. Yeah. Need to do a BC, potentially a good project. That's that's definitely where, where my mind was going. Um, Minimal benefit. Yeah. And so I'll say often, you know, we, we find ourselves, you know, we don't want to overestimate those benefits. So to me, I, you know, want to be careful about that. And, and um, you know, I'm thinking a raised median should have a good, good benefit, but so variety of factors at play, so. I like 20 less people will be severely injured or killed, do the project. 
Boom. There you go. Yeah, so that's that's where. I like that. That's so when you do the benefit cost that that can uh, bring that really really home too. Um, but yeah, that's uh, I'm actually going to pull up the pull up the summary again. Right. So this is uh, this is one year, and so if our fatal and injury is going down by a crash, you know, almost a crash a year. Um, yeah. And that's you know, and that's that's on on a three mile piece of road. So three mile piece of road. So so yeah, that's where you got to kind of pour over it, dig into it, think about it, and why you're looking at that those first two boxes up there. They they are that's very helpful. All right, good good answers. Thank you all. I'm gonna have one more question on this. Um, inputs and factors influencing the results. Did you see anything that jumped out at you? I uh, so you're looking at the spreadsheets. Maybe you're looking in there, and and I don't know. Maybe the person who was asking question four saw um, what the CMS were. I uh, you know are there are there CMS that are driving this? Anything that that you think um, the project team should know about? Um, I'm going to say just one thing that uh, uh, lighting, lighting has a, uh, you know, is a factor in this and um, you know, you're not everywhere, but there are many highways where um, we have good, good lighting in Florida. And uh, I think that that, you know, so I, I know, it, again, it's not everywhere. I'm just saying, but there are um, compared to other states, <laughs> we, uh, you know, have good, good lighting. So, um, yeah, all right, so, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, all, all good answers. I'm not gonna, I'll leave this up just for another uh, little bit here, but uh, yeah, the calibration factors, right. So, so actually as, as you're typing things in, I'll scroll through it. Yeah, that, that 1.63 calibration factor, um, uh, so I, I, you know, just to show when we say that that has a big impact, I'm going to just, I'm just going to flip it off just so you, you could do this on your own. If I, if I, if I was to flip that off, if it, which makes it uncalibrated. So I'm not saying you do this, this is not, I, but just so you know that it makes a difference. Um, the, uh, the numbers are going to go, are going to be very different. <laughs> and so um 4.5 11.5 um i didn't didn't affect the intersection just the segment and so if i put those in there I need to apologize you folks are typing i'm going to flip it back in just a second but um you know so now we've got a oh. 30 33 percent reduction so that's that's why I say you know pay attention to what's moving the needle, know what's inf influencing things, and then be able to 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 uh, to uh, report that back to folks or ask again ask the questions if you're if you're that project manager you're responsible you're the reviewer ask the questions like this one you know what's driving this um, so let me scroll through these a little bit so yeah lighting speed geometrics accurate you want to make sure that ADT the length and the ADT exposure that drives the whole everything in these equations. And if someone has an inaccurate length, um, it, you can't compare it, and it will it, things will be off. And you're trying to dig through it, and you're trying to look for lighting, and and it's the length. You got to make the ADT and the AADT and the length are key things that have to be examined. You need to make sure that you're build and no build. Um, that that everything is comparable, and that you know what you're comparing. So I can't emphasize that enough. Um, okay, so so good, good, good answers. Thank you. Um, let's go on to uh, the other part of this case study. So we're going to um, I'm just going to tell you. So this is this is what happened. Uh, you were working. You you did this, and uh, and um, then the the forecasting. Uh, the, the traffic uh, forecasting folks came to you and they said, hey, you know what? We, we finished up those forecasts you asked for and uh, the AADT in the build is actually gonna be 30,000. Um, so we, we think the traffic's gonna go up. So again, uh, um, 
uh, suspension, you know, what is it? Uh, um, just, just imagine. Right? So I, you know, I don't, don't know why in this particular case, but let's just play along that uh, that the AEDT goes up to thirty thousand, and uh, and so we're going to need to change a, just a couple of inputs to test out what that means. So and they say, all right, and the team wants to know, well, what does that mean? What is? And everybody's in a hurry, and uh, so you pull out your spreadsheet again, and that never happens. Yeah, no, never. And um, make sure I, I set this back. Um, I gotta undo, undo, and and get that back uh, to where it was. Get the calibration factor back in there. And so uh, you go into uh, row 11 on the segment one of the of the uh, build tab. So again, the, the the forecasting team gave you this new AADT. For the build scenario only, they're saying if you build this raised median, there'll be more traffic. Okay, let me. I'll tell you what that what that does. So we we put in the thirty thousand in cell in the uh, row. It's row eleven, and we're going to do that for both segments. Thirty thousand for both segments. All right, so get that that build file open and make that. It's one change on each sheet. Everything else is exactly as it was before. No other changes, just the new forecast came in. And then we're gonna make one change on each of the intersection sheets. And it's the same same thing, let's row 10 now, where we up, uh, update the AADT for the intersections. So essentially we're gonna change those four numbers. And with that, um, we've done all the changes we need to make. We just need to go to the urban site total tab and pull out our new numbers. So we'll go back just to make sure if you, now I kind of, um, if, if you just got it open or something, it's, it's row 11 in the segment tabs that you're gonna change the 30,000, both of them. And it's row 10. Zoom in here so you can see it better. Row 10 in the intersection tabs, where it's that's the uh, major street uh, daily traffic. So 30,000 for row 10. So you change those four numbers, and then go to your urban site total, get a new set of numbers, and copy those into. I don't have to. Yeah, I think I. Uh, I got it fixed, okay. Um, copy those into the right-hand side of the crash summary work uh, crash summary worksheet. So now we've got data in all of the yellow tabs. All right, so I am gonna pause there and let folks kinda catch up if they are yeah so it's just like it says on the sheet there 30,000 30, changing all four input tabs and the results in the summary sheet on the right side of the sheet which is uh, over here and lo and behold our uh, our crashes go up not unexpected our volume went up so now since our volume went up our crashes are going to go up and so suddenly the bottom part of this table gets even more important than it was before before it was important you wanted to know what was happening with your crash rates which is basically the um, uh, effectiveness of the of the facility you know the performance of the facility on a per uh, per exposure basis, you know, per vehicle mile traveled or per entering vehicle. So to me, that is always a very important measure. The, they're both important. The one um, is important for the magnitude and the other is important for kind of the, the rate. Are we making the rate better um, or not? And in this case, um, the total is going up and we can explain that to the project team. Well, now traffic's going up. We're serving more people. There's more exposure. Our crashes are going to go up. And then you've got a good story on the segments, but our, our segment crash rate is still going down. We're, we're those um, on a per mile traveled basis, we're, we're 
Uh, we've got good performance. It's better than it is now. So we're serving them better on the segments, but at the intersections, it's worse. We, we are, our rate is worse and we've got more crashes. And so the project team is just, you know, continue on and says, we don't, we don't like that outcome. We don't want, we do not want to show that. We don't want to make the intersections worse. Uh, we need to do something. What can we do? What can we do to make the intersections um, better? And so I will ask you that question. What, what can you do to make the intersections, um, to make the intersections better? And uh, let me just, yeah, go ahead. And, and so I, I will ask that. Uh, yeah, so actually I'm gonna go ahead and do the, the next two Mentimeters. So how did the results change? And then how could the build alternative be modified to reduction in intersection crashes? So let's go ahead and pull those over and give me your, your thoughts on, on, uh, on that. What do you think the new results, you know, again, so, at your your own you got the data in front of you on your own screen um how do you interpret uh those results and if you don't have it in front of you on your screen i can uh kind of you can cheat and look at mine i'll i'll make it smaller <laughs> so i see more crashes improve crashes go up increased yeah so you can take a snapshot of my screen if you need to now, and then I'm going to move it off so I can see what people are doing. Yeah, increases, more crashes. Higher volume, higher likelihood of crashes, right? Okay. All right, so I'm, I'm going to um, flip to... The more challenging one. Oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah. Well, I actually, I need to scroll down. So for segments, worse intersections, right? Focus area that increase. Yep, increase crashes exactly. Um, remove some of the movements such as yield flee <laughs> forward turns. Yep, safer segment. All right. Um, yep. All right. So good, good stuff. Let's go on to the next, to the next question. How could the bill turn be modified? To a reduction in intersection crashes, to yield a reduction in intersection crashes. So, what can we do? What can we do to the project team is not happy with this result, and they're your your, your project manager. Nobody's nobody's happy. What can we do? <laughs> what can we do to improve this? And you can, um, you know, this is a opportunity for you to work on your own to, to test it. I'm, I've got I've got an idea that I will show you here in a minute. Um, but uh, you've got the spreadsheets and can kind of test it out on your own. Add lighting, check to right turn lanes, the alternative intersections, roundabout, mm -hmm. CFI, modify the signal, roundabout, do a nice analysis, good. Um, add turn lanes with better signal coordination, slower, lower speeds, yeah. Potential for alternative control measures at intersections, change geometry, turn lane signal timing, protected phases, get additional turn lanes, capex. Okay. Yeah, do nothing. You could decide. You could could decide this is this is uh, this is okay. That's part yeah. of the game. All right. All right, so I got a number of uh, good options here, and actually I'm going to so I see protected turns or turn lanes, um, protected turning movements. I'm going to pull around the build, the revised mm -hmm. build model, and uh, and say so. So my, you know, just kind of for this for purposes of this, I thought well, I looked at it, I thought well. I've got protected permitted, and you know, maybe um, this this permissive is yielding to to peds. That's the the uh, the third leg. But on the main street, if I can go to protected only phasing, um, and I would just change that. I'm gonna zoom in on the two intersection sheets. So right, I only care about the intersections, and I want to test out. 
protected phasing and I want to go to my the traffic ops part of my team and say, hey, can I do protected phasing? Uh, can you put that put that in, run that, see if that works. If if uh, if we have the capacity for protected only, um, that could could help. And so I put protected only in rows 21 and 22 of of the four legged intersection, and then only in rows 21 of the three legged intersection, the three SG. So I changed three three locations from protected permissive to protected only. I go back to my urban site total. I grab the numbers out of here. And I'm going to drop them in here. And now I'm still showing an increase in crashes. I have more traffic as the, it's not there's it's not going to be easy to come up with a reduction in crashes when I'm serving um, an extra 6,000 vehicles a day. Um, but now all of my rates, I have mitigated the rate situation with the intersections by switching to protected phasing. And so the model would predict that we've got a, a decrease. It's not a big decrease, kind of just keeping the status, the status quo for the rates. Um, but I've, I've, again, I told you it's nonlinear. And we've got this situation where by just adding traffic, we're, we're changing the, the rate slightly. And now I've mitigated that. And so now I've got a situation where I can go back to the team and say, we're, we are serving the public um, better in terms of, uh, you know, looking at exposure. I mean, every, every mile driven through this uh, corridor you know, is a safer mile driven than when we started, but we do have, we have more crashes because there's more people driving it. So, so to me, that is, that is how you can use this tool as you're working through, um, through your project and you uh, see, you know, what, what does it tell you and then what happens when you change things? And then, you know, really here, we've got two alternatives now and, uh, and folks can kind of uh, pick which one, um, you know, we, if we, we'd have to change the 30,000 for the first one, but you can, you can then compare and contrast and, and look at, as the one person said, you know, how many crashes are we uh, preventing? And, and you could do a what if where, uh, you know, what if that much traffic was going through? If you want to show people, look, if we were really apples to apples and we had 30,000 for the no build, this is what the numbers would be um, as a point of comparison. It's not a real scenario because they can't get through, but but this is what would happen. And we are definitely better than that is, is the kind of thing that you got to, when you're talking to folks about, about the, these analyses. Um, and so I will say it is tough. What we've got on the screen right here is very difficult you got a project and crashes are going up and everyone says, well, I don't want the crashes to go up. Well, we're serving more traffic. And so that's one of the things that you have to wrestle with on a lot of projects. And um, so there's a variety of ways to, to address it. I kind of spell out part of one, but going back and doing the apples to apples with the what if um, could also be part of that. I mean, there's a number of other things you can do too. And, and so it's just, again, gotta be thoughtful, make sure that you, um, you're conveying uh, accurate information in, in a, in a uh, way everyone can understand. So, all right, Beth, what have I, what else have I missed or Adam, are there questions? I, I think that's great. I'll just add a, uh, maybe a story from experience um, to, the, to the point about crashes going up as traffic volume goes up in a, for a project that will remain nameless in the state that will remain nameless we were working on a big inter interchange improvement project and it, a project like that right it's been going on for years and for years safety had been in the purpose and need statement um but it was more like a throwback thing where you know years ago every you would always say safety is part of my purpose and need because anything we did was improving safety by the time we got to the NEPA analysis, um, the, the demonstrated safety need, there really wasn't a safety issue on the corridor. By the time we got there, it's a target zero environment now. These are just PDO crashes. It's not high on the state's um, uh, ranking list. And then we do whatever improvements we're doing and 
um, crashes go up. And so there was a whole, it was a very sort of dicey situation to navigate because safety had been expressed as a, as a primary need when in fact it was a congested location. We were talking about low severity crashes anyway. Um, and relative to other issue places in the state, it wasn't very high. And, um, and then to boot, we had that increase because crashes were going up. So it's uh, uh, just proceed with thought and caution as you would any other aspect of the work we do. Right. <laughs> All right. Cool. Um, Rob, I do have a, a, two questions about segmentation. Um, sure. uh, just what are the just uh, overview of rules and when you need to create segments? Um, should segments be every change in the cross section, or is there like a a guide to what's acceptable and how short or how long could segments be? Beth, do you want this one or you want, want me to? I feel like we should. Well, um, good either way. Jack team it. I, um, that, you know, that's gets to the art form of doing this. Um, and so I, I think, if I remember right, I think there's a statement in the manual about the segments, you know, don't have to be don't go shorter than 0.01 miles, but I don't, I don't remember if that's my, you're nodding Rob. So I think yeah, you remember that number yeah, um, as well, or we both made up the same thing. Um, but so there's that. And then the, the way I think about it is, is, you know, do you, you don't want to get so short that you can't like mean, you know, particularly on a freeway, for example, or a higher speed facility, you know, if vehicles are going by some change in the cross section in no time. How, how does that, how might that affect your safety or not? So I think about that a lot. So it's really like substantive things that will influence, could influence how crashes occur. Um, and there is some guidance in the manual about um, like sh things like shoulder width, you know, if it's, um, oh good, you're pulling it up. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know, sort of the rounding that you do. So it's, it's, uh, it's an art form. I don't know, Rob, how does that? Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And you know, so it's, you know, the, homogeneous with respect to characteristics for traffic volumes, roadway design characteristics and traffic control features. And so you're trying to get these homogeneous sections. Um, it, um, but you don't want to uh, um, get so caught up with every little change. I mean, yeah. this, this, these tools are based on the equations we've been showing and, and it's kind of, uh, and all the spreadsheet tools, even IHSDM is kind of a souped up spreadsheet uh, where each piece is looking at the inputs that you give it. And uh, it's not like a simulation model or anything. It's a, each piece looks at the inputs that you provide and does these calculations. And and there is guidance in here for um, using weighted averages. If, if, you're, if your shoulder kind of goes in and out, it's, it's eight and it's seven. You don't, you don't need to just break it into an infinite number of little pieces. Um, you, you can break into a lot of pieces. And because of the nature, that spreadsheet nature, it'll calculate all the little pieces. And IHSDM will do that uh, for you, uh, if you use that software. But if you're doing it yourself, I guess I, we've always used kind of a uh, um, uh, kind of a common sense. You know, look, yeah, nothing, nothing too short. I mean, I, you know, if I start getting down to 50 foot segments, um, you know, I'll do that sometimes if there's a 50 foot design exception or something. But but a lot of times, it's you know, we want to kind of have yeah. things in little meaningful chunks that we you know that we can kind of understand and that. Um, and that we think are representative of that facility, how it's functioning, and 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 not kind of over overcook it, so to speak. Um, yeah, there is guidance in and here. I would, I would also add, I I completely agree with Rob, and and I would add, you know, 
think about, he hit, hit on this, but think about how you're using the outcomes of your work. You know, yeah. we're, if it's a design exception, you might need to be more specific. And it's usually a smaller section anyway. Um, but if it's a large scale, uh, more of a planning level assessment of maybe op traffic operations strategies and trying to understand the implications of those, um, then maybe just more bigger chunks can be okay. Bigger, longer segments missing, skipping some of the details can be okay. And I think of it in the same way, I've done a lot of traffic operations analysis in my past as well. And so, you know, there's sort of the critical movement analysis that you can do to get that first cut assessment to a detailed micro simulation model you might need to do at a congested location and you're needing to establish signal phasing. So, it, you know, it depends on how you're going to be using the work as well, that depth of segmentation. Yeah. So, and so sometimes uh, there are, there are times when uh, making some uh, simplifying assumptions that don't, you know, your overall length stays the same, but you know, your, your gore points are 50 feet apart and on opposite sides of the freeway and you say, well, I'm using, I'm going to align them. I'm not going to use, uh, I'm not going to have it. They're only, they're, they're a uh, hundredth of a mile apart. Um, we're going to call that the same. And so, you know, there's, there's things like that where um, we'll make those, again, try to keep it reasonable and rational. All right, Adam, other questions? Is there anything else? I've got some questions up here for case study four, just things to think about. Um, how did calibration, we actually looked at that. Calibration had a pretty big impact. Um, was an important thing to, to think about and make sure you've got it in there. And then what factors are not in the spreadsheet that you think should be considered? I'm um, sure you know, some of the things that were mentioned, um, you know, were, were uh, not in there. I mean, so speed, for example, is not in this, not in the spreadsheet. Um, and, uh, you know, why do you agree or disagree with the results and how would the results change if the build used roundabouts? So, you know, you could, you could actually now uh, test that with the new SPF. So, so there's, uh, yeah, a lot of things to think about and then, and then how you know, get into when you discuss a project like that and you, you're, uh, you're presenting it to, to others um, or asking questions about it of, of folks who've done the work. So, all right, Adam, good to go. Um, yeah, there are some other questions, but I'm thinking maybe we'll address them as we go and we'll follow up at the end. Okay. All right. Sounds good. All right. Uh, well, it's time for the second case study um, or the last, you know, for today and second and last. So we're going to do case study number five. It's a freeway example um, and uh, CD roads. And uh, so uh, again, we've entered the information, so you won't have to enter a bunch of information, um, but this does, uh, will show some of the complexity of doing uh, um, freeway projects uh, and the the challenges and things. So I'm, I'm hopefully this is uh, is useful to you all. The, uh, we've got a project shown um, area. The top is the current condition. Um, figure numbering is again because this is coming out of the out of the manual, um, and uh, so you can refer to that if if you would like. Um, but we've got two diamonds that are closely spaced. And the proposal on the table is to um, run CD roads along uh, the freeway and, and kind of connect it, them. And uh, again, not saying this is a, a good, is just for, for example purposes, right? So, so, uh, so, so play along, um, <laughs> this CD road and, uh, and, and, Folks are asking, all right, so how is this going to impact safety? And we got, we're doing our operational analysis over here, and we'll get you those those ADTs you tell, keep telling us you need. Um, how's this going to impact safety? And um, you see, we've segmented it here: segment one, two, three, four, and five. Um, in the top, we've kind of aligned the gores, so we end up with those five segments, and then and then three segments on the bottom. Um, and then the ramps are going to be part of the analysis. So, so that's the kind of setup uh, for the project and the analysis, the study area. Um, 
And so as we've been talking about, study limits and segmentation are very important. Um, you know, one of the things that you just, every project you have to make sure, again, no matter where you are in the process, but especially if you are a reviewer comment, did you use the same study limits? And so is your exposure the same? And I just, I just want to keep emphasizing that because that, that can lead to the wrong conclusion if someone uh, of erroneous that, well, this project stopped here and the other one went further. No, no, they got to always be the same. And for every alternative, no build and all builds, we got to have the same um, exposure or, or it's not comparable and we won't be able to do what we want. We'll, we won't work out, right? So, um, so here, uh, the site limits, segmentation, um, make sure that that's all defined and, uh, and that you are able to then uh, kind of track it through. Make sure that you're going to um, yeah, get to answers that you can, you can use and even relate back to a uh, segment. So sometimes at the end of a project, you might want to map the predicted crashes back to your figures and you want to kind of be able to track all that. So, all right. So that's the setup. And uh, <clears throat> during scoping, we decide that uh, it's going to be um, yeah, Interstate 100 <laughs> and Alpha 0 to 2.1. Um, and uh, and we're going to look at uh, two years again because we want to match the traffic operations. Although you may um, decide, and you'll see here in a minute, uh, that leads to kind of an interesting outcome when you, you do the 20 years. We want the 20 years. So actually, um, uh, we're going to actually talk about the all the years when we do this. But but we we kind of have uh, set endpoints and then. Um, Got uh, freeway with two diamonds CD for the uh, build freeway with two lane CD, and then um, and then we've got a number of lanes and um, SPFs. So just kind of working my way down the list here. The uh, tool we're going to use is ISAT E, and the segment length is 2.1. And we got our, our growth rate and, and calibration factors. We don't have calibration factors for freeways in Florida, so it's none. And we're not going to use uh, EV. So that is the, the scope and methods um, for this particular example. And we're going to use ISAT E. And so we're going to review the no build alternatives, review the file, enter the results, look at the build, review that file, and enter the results by facility type and severity. Uh, into the summary worksheet. So that's the next thing to do. If you haven't already opened up those files, I would say go ahead and open up these these three files, the no build, all the CS5 alternatives, no build, build, and crash summary worksheet. So similar to last time, three sheets. Um, there are uh, embedded macros, and so you need to enable the macros uh, when you open those up. So the no build, File looks like this, and it'll open up with a this mine a yellow bar. I'm going to enable the content so that you're able to uh, to run run it um, should you need to run it. And build, and then there should be a crash summary that looks like that. All right, so, so those are the three spreadsheets. I'm going to go through the uh, first one here. So this is the the uh, yeah the, the no build spreadsheet. Oh, I just need to. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. So let's go ahead and and, and walk through this. Uh, it opens the main tab. Far, far left where you enter uh, some information here. And if you've never used ISAD, I will just tell you that the year's really important. And then this no crash data, if you're not using EB, you definitely want to check the, that to no crash data. Lots of people run into all kinds of problems. And so tip for someone who's maybe had trouble with that is off on the right, there's a clear temp button over here. And sometimes you have to clear that, clear out the temporary data to get it to let you put in the years. So for those who uh, are never going to use these spreadsheets, you can <laughs> just best all that but uh um but the years you know sometimes you have to work through the years there are there are uh the spreadsheets sometimes a little finicky 
So uh, the first tab after the main is the input freeway segments. And we've gone ahead and entered all the data um, in for the uh, freeway segments for the no build condition. So number of through lanes, the length, the uh, lane width, and all, all the information here. So that and if you scroll down, see there's information about the, uh, the ramps. So I'll just, I'll just scroll through these so you see what's in there. So it's number of, uh, I'll also zoom in a little bit. So number of through lanes and segment length is in there. Uh, uh, very, very important. Um, and then whether or not there's any curvature, then lane width, shoulder width, inside and outside, median width, presence of uh, rumble strips, shoulder and various things. So in a, you know, Another project, there might be more information here where we've got more information about the median and the shoulder width, clear zone information, the roadside data, and then all the ramp access information. Uh, how far away are ramps? Are they add drop or speed change lanes? That's the SC is speed change. Um, are they right side, left side? And then um, you know, is there a type B weave, which we'll talk about in just a minute you know, in the section? And so in this case, we've got a type B weave. Uh, coded in here and then we've got the uh, information for the other direction so one of the things if you're uh, unfamiliar with uh, the way the freeway uh, analysis works for the highway safety manual both directions uh, are examined at the same time so unlike the operational analysis where on a freeway it's one direction only uh, for safety it's both directions are evaluated together and that leads to often more segmentation. If ramps come in at different places, you need to segment it for both sides at the same time. You gotta work through that segmentation process. So um, very important to realize that. And, and so when results are coming out there for the entire facility. Um, and, uh, and so just, just good, to, good to understand that for freeways, it's both sides for the main line. And then um, proportion of traffic during high volume hours and the freeway volume data. That proportion of traffic during high volume hours, um, something you can go in and, and calculate and change. Um, it doesn't always lead to as much of a CMF factor as I would sometimes like it to, um, but uh, it, is, it is what it is and it's there. And it's one of the few things that'll, that um, you can use to address uh, um, highly congested areas. So there's, um, so that is that is in there and available. And then uh, in here, we've got all the volume data put in as well as all the ramp data. And so this is, is important. The top and the bottom are very important, the length and this volume information. Okay, so um, if you've got questions about that, please go ahead and type them into Adam. Either Adam can reply or I can uh, go back over something, but uh, we're gonna move on to the ramp segments. So that's the next tab. And we've got uh, data entered for um, all eight of the ramps in this no build condition. And, uh, and so you know, it's a uh, number of lanes, then the uh, segment length, and then the average traffic speed uh, on the freeway, and then the um, segment type and type of control at the crossroad terminal. And, uh, and then we've got information about the, uh, there's no shame, we assume straight straight ramps, <laughs> no horizontal, <laughs> although that can go in there. And uh, and then the cross section data. So it's lane width, shoulder width, presence or absence, excuse me, presence of uh, lane add or lane drop by taper. There's you know, a lot of information that really has an impact on safety goes into these, into these spreadsheets. And then roadside data for all of your ramps, uh, ramp access data, um, if there's ramps connecting to ramps and uh, and then your traffic volume data. And I'll just mention, uh, yeah, that's, that's the end uh, for ramps. There's um, less information required for ramps, but um, the uh, information about barrier and barrier, sometimes folks will kind of be tempted to skip over barrier, but barrier has an impact on crashes and it has an impact on severity. And so I'd encourage you, uh, we had that talk before about driveway density. Barrier is something you want to pay attention to. You want to make sure that it's comparable between alternatives when it should be, and that it's not. And that if something is actually going to change, that you capture that change if you can. I know often we're doing this pretty early in the process, and all the barriers necessarily set, but it's it is something to think through. Barrier um, barrier influences the equations, and 
it's not something to be skipped over too lightly if you you know again you might decide well we're going to make them the same so it's comparable but but be thoughtful about it um even though that that does take a little bit of time to to think that through and, and solve that so is beth any thoughts uh, that's the end of the input data for the this example no i think you walk through it i think you walk through it well and um you know your your message a few minutes ago about the segmentation and the two it's a bi-directional prediction of performance is a good one to remember since again it's not um not typical from a traffic operations perspective and so it's and it as your freeway situations become more complex the fact that it's bi-directional makes this even harder to deal with yep yep okay um all right so so where we've entered the uh the input data and we're going to go to our output summary and so the output summary uh, provides the crash prediction and it's not highlighted if you download this from the web which this is free on the web um, uh, it isn't highlighted like this but i've highlighted the crashes for freeways and for ramps and uh, both the total and then by severity and uh, so those are the numbers that you know, can look at and then you've got uh, the annual numbers and there's all kinds of additional uh, information there are estimates i think i mentioned this yesterday by um type of crash and you know sometimes this is a little to me um i wouldn't lean on this too too heavily but you certainly can look and see if it tells and um gives you useful information um, but we're starting to kind of parse things out split things into smaller numbers um, and this is based on averages you might want to do this based on uh, localized data rather than uh, what the defaults are in here but it at least gives you something to look at for single versus multi-vehicle and types of crash uh, by severity so it's a starting point and can be useful um, but back up to the the summary totals that's where we want to be right now and want to pull over the crash summary workbook I've got a place for place for you to put the uh, 10 numbers right here that you do need to transpose them so they're they're uh, rows and you're gonna need to make them into columns and so you can enter them however is uh, uh, your preference I'm going to uh, do a copy paste here and so I highlight those, do a copy, go to the other cell, do a paste, special, and values, and transpose, and okay, special, put some right in there, um, values, transpose, put some right in there. So follow that, you kind of pull those numbers out. I just, you know, to me, the, the value of, of getting in there and looking at this, you'll see we're going to make one small change here in a minute. Um, and again, if you're not a doer, um, but just knowing what is kind of a little enough about what's happening behind the scenes that you can ask the uh, the probing questions to me is pretty important. Um, and so we've copied in our crashes. And just like the other sheet, we've got a uh, number of crashes and a crash rate. Um, for freeways and for ramps, we've calculated them separately. So just like intersections and segments, we separated freeways and ramps. And then we've got the totals um, by severity, by facility, and then the total total, um, and which matches the total total over here, 1349.4. So, so that's kind of our starting point. That's our no build. And we uh, did all eight ramps. We did the five different segments. So now we're gonna pull over the build file and we're gonna do something similar. And I'm not gonna walk through that in as much detail, but just to show you, there's only three segments for the build and that same information has been entered. So we've, we've entered all the, all the information and we've got the, that type B weave that was in there is, uh, is gone now. And uh, then for the ramp segments, um, well, you're gonna have to bear with me a moment. My, uh, I'll keep I'll keep playing through. I've got to uh, 
reopen my Excel. It, it's crashed. Um, so, so apologize. So the um, the build, uh, yeah, we'll get right back in there. The build um, has uh, uh, the the uh, the ramps. Yeah, let's uh, close that. And can apologize. All right, so it should look like this. Uh, sorry, the uh, the freeway has the three freeways, and then the ramp has. It's going to be a problem. I'm going to describe it to you. Um, that the the uh, ramp has four ramps in it, and all that data has been entered as well. And I don't know why Excel is going to do this to me, but that's all right. It keeps it exciting um, so uh, on the um, tab here we've got the uh, the number of crashes that uh, the build is predicted to have and you can see that they are different and so we'll go ahead and put those into the crash summary worksheet I'll say if you have questions about the build and if for some reason I'm not able to make it work um, Adam, you can uh, share your screen and and we'll uh, walk through it. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put those in here using the same process of uh, oh, gotta a special and values transpose, and I'll get my other ones in there. I'm going to go ahead and close this out so it doesn't. Give me problems. All right, and so um, with the uh, uh, build in there, if you've been able to copy that in, and I will have it in just a moment, you can see that. Well, I just, what do you see? I'm gonna. So it should look like this. All right, so we've uh, we've got our no build. We've got our build with the CD road. We've dropped everything in. We've got number of crashes and we've got changes in crash rates. And so I'm gonna give everybody just a minute to uh, either screen capture this, if you didn't do this or uh, or follow along, do it do it yourself uh, in, the, in the sheets and I'm gonna, pull back up the presentation. I've got a couple of questions I want to ask you about this before talking you know, any more about it. Um, other than to say, you might notice at the top, got a strange number in row two, uh, crash summary, 21 years. That's because we picked um, uh, a 20, we picked the operational analysis years, which I, I think of fences and you got the posts and then the, between the posts and we've got 21 posts. We got 21 years because of uh, in this case, I set up the spreadsheet 2025 to 2045. And if you count, if it's inclusive, you end up with 21 years. Um, often that's why for safety, we'll say, uh, we'll have a little discussion with the operations folks and say, well, 20, I wanna do, they want those two years. And so maybe we'll do those and match them. And then maybe for the 20 year analysis, we'll say, well, can we do the first entire year that it's open to traffic? And so we'll slide that back to 2026. In 2045 and then we got a 20 year period or just use 21 I mean, there's, a, there's more than one way to do it but just wanting to be aware that's why that number is is uh is strange um adam we've never had that conversation before it's uh um all right so let me go on to the next question why uh what do the initial results of case study five indicate and what are some important inputs and factors influencing the results so a pull over Mentimeter, those are the, the questions. Just be thinking about those things. What do the initial results of case study five indicate? What do you see in the spreadsheet? What do the initial results of case study five indicate? And I'm gonna pull this back back around you've got your mentimeter on another screen or on your phone 
So if you don't have it, you can look up my screen and make it a little bit bigger. How would you interpret these results? And Beth, I'm not looking, it's hiding my Mentimeter. So um, I can pull it over. What do you, what do you see? Yeah, I will, I don't have my Mentimeter up. I'll pull it up and let you know. Oh, I grabbed it. So, seeing things like trade-off freeway, but the ramps, freeways improve, but the ramps, not so much. Crashes and crash rates tell a different uh, story. Safety improvement along the freeway. Increase in crash rates of low severity crash types on ramps. Decrease on the freeway. Crashes go down as a system. Another way to look at some of the same findings is better freeway operations at the expense of more PDO ramp crashes. So that the <clears throat> getting to the trade offs that we have, right. to, we have to consider. So that's it. All right. All right. So I'm, you know, one of the things that uh, jumped out at me when we put this together was, it, so many of you mentioned there's actually two things. is the shift in crashes. Um, freeways are going down. Ramps are going up. Ramps have um, typically a slightly uh higher crash rate and so we're shifting more traffic from the uh the kind of the the lower crash rate facility to a higher crash rate facility and so that's being reflected here um, but that and that is a real issue in a lot of projects so we have an operational solution that uh, maybe um, leads to longer and more ramps and moves traffic off traffic off the main line with that has a generally a lower crash rate onto these other facilities and we're braiding things and, it, and they have higher crash rates um, that go back to that they have barrier maybe on both sides and maybe the shoulders are narrow. And, and so that all plays into this. And so this is not an uncommon result to have uh, your freeway crashes go down, your ramp crashes go up, your total crashes go down um, um, just by virtue of kind of how everything is, is playing out. Um, so the uh sometimes they they it goes up i will say that the the ka numbers um they go down and they go down for both freeways and ramps uh as a rate and then as a uh and then the the total goes down just a little bit so anyway they, there's a, a lot to chew on here and to think through and kind of look look through but i'm gonna go ahead and yeah, jump to the next question um inputs and factors influencing the results i'll just see what you if you look at those spreadsheets what um what might be uh leading us to these to these results and then we have a news flash someone's going to stick their head in your office and and tell you something <laughs> What are things that are influencing uh, these results? May have to uh, provide your feedback, Rob, about what, what you see as influencing things. Well, I'm gonna, uh, we'll give people a few more, I see. Uh, a few more things popping up here. Okay. We got volumes, weave, merge, diverge, change um, less traffic on the freeway. 
Oh, there we go. Mm -hmm. And uh, more ramp traffic through the CD road. Yep. Yeah. And we'll pull over the spreadsheet. And um, I guess show where the, the, the CMFs um, for these ISID spreadsheets um, are on these uh, output, three output sheets off to the right of the output summary. And so you can go in here and look at these CMFs and see which ones are really moving the needle up or down, or you can ask someone else to do that for you and tell you what is moving the needle up or down. And uh, I'll just draw your attention to, to this one. Segment three has a CMF of over two. So that particular segment, which is the middle segment, the, the weave segment has a CMF of, of, uh, of over two. And so that is an attention getter. Um, and it's in the lane change CMF, which is uh, where uh, you handle um, lane changing dynamics and the length, you know, distance from a ramp, uh, an on-ramp that is uh, upstream or an off-ramp that is downstream. And uh, it also handles the, uh, I mentioned the type B weave that's in there. And so um, that's one thing that uh, is really moving the needle. There's a few other things. They, I mentioned that high volume CMF, it's 1.111. And then the ramp exit, uh, we got, you know where the ramp exits are right there we've got cmfs that that move the needle there and then you it repeats them i mentioned before that this is for property damage only crashes so the, this top part is all for the your fatal and injury crashes so these are pretty important cmfs up here at the top i didn't mean to scroll down so far that uh that you know move the needle for, for your fatal and injury crashes so that's one place to go look and so look at this you know wow two is a big number um and and so the, the actually the news flash is that uh so you're sitting in your office you're pouring over these results um thinking about it and the person that did this work for you and, and sent you this summary said i'm sorry i made a a little mistake i didn't fully understand uh the the weave piece and i um i actually didn't um mean uh, i shouldn't have coded the type b weave i didn't i didn't you know i well i wasn't sure what 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 a b and c types were and so i said yes and and so I, just a quick refresher that uh um uh, type b weave is the show on the left this is right out of the highway safety manual um it matches uh other documents and including the hcm and the highway capacity manual and others um but so we got a type um Type B weaves are on the left, where uh, either uh, someone getting on or someone getting off does not have to make a uh, lane change. They can just go straight on, or they can uh, go, you know, off without changing lanes. Um, typical type A weave is shown on the right, and it's uh, traffic gets on, got an auxiliary lane, traffic gets back off. So, uh, so yeah, so the person. Uh, mistakenly coded a type B weave on the right here when they and they're like yeah I, I did that wrong should have been a type A weave on the left and they said just let me go run back to my office and fix that and I'll give you a quick update and so we're gonna do that we're gonna run back run back to the office and fix this little this seemingly small little make a small little tweak type B back to a, a type A and so we go into the no build sheet and we're gonna just toggle we're gonna just toggle um four items again there's just four things that need to be changed to go back from a type b to an a so in the freeway segments tab um where uh, if you go to the freeway segments tab of your no build sheet and you go to column k um there are two places down in uh, pretty far down um, in the ramp access data, it's row 76, and again in row 90, where it says, yes, I have a type B weave in my segment. And if you don't have a type, if it's type A or type C, there's, there are type Cs, you want to say, no, I don't have one of those um, 
I don't have one of those kinds of ramps. And then I want to do it here. And I'm a little concerned my macros are not going to work, but it's all right. <laughs> Adam, I need you to give give me the numbers. Um, and uh, and so you're going to click no there, and then go to the um, one other uh, minor change that that the, the person doing it needs to make is to go to the ramp. Um, segments and turn those back into one. So mm -hmm. they're all ones. So they, they mistakenly coded a two lane ramp and a type B weave. They shouldn't have done it. So, but that's it. Those are the four things we need to change. We just need to change on the freeway segments um, in column K, those two type B weaves to no. And hopefully yours goes white underneath there. Mine did not. And then in the ramp segments, just make them all ones. So every ramp is a one lane ramp. Um, and this is a change of the no build just to kind of get it to the way it should have been. So this is a, a more typical situation where the type A weave comes on, auxiliary lane comes off, typical weave. And then you go to the main tab and you hit perform calculations. And hopefully, it's gonna work. So those are the, the four changes. Change the type B weave on the freeway segments, change the number of lanes on the ramps, go to the main tab, hit perform calculations, go back to your output summary. And we've got another set of 10 numbers here. <laughs> he says with relief. Yeah, right. <laughs> it worked. And so, um, you're going to take those 10 numbers and put them into your no build. And that will be, this is the last thing I'm asking you to do. This is it. <laughs> so we're no more. Uh, so we're going to paste values, transpose, drop them in there. And so this is a typical type A weave um, compared to this CD road concept. So, and, and, uh, Person ran your office. They apologized profusely, but but they you didn't go anywhere. It only he only just sent it to you. He just finished, and he and he caught it caught it and fixed it. And so here we are. So then he sends you this new spreadsheet. It looks like what you see on my screen. Hopefully you're able to uh, either follow along doing it yourself or you just look at my screen. Um, and it looks like this. Suddenly, um, you know the freeway is still going down. We're taking traffic off the freeway, so it's going down. The ramps are going up. Um, and now we've got an increase in our fatal and injury crashes um, overall. Um, and uh, we've got a decrease in total crashes. This is where it gets complicated. I got a decrease in total crashes, but we don't have a decrease for our higher severity crashes. And that's pretty important to us. Um, and interestingly, the rates are actually going down but because we've shifted the exposure from the freeway to ramps which have higher rates we've gone up a little bit so there's this you know the equations aren't again they're not really they're not linear there are different equations for high severity and property damage only crashes and so we've got this kind of mixed bag of results um and often often it's like this where you you get it and you're you then you have to figure out well what do we what do we do with this um you know do we just like the one where we change the protected permissive to protected only maybe we need to do something else here to try to address this issue um and so the the the, the prediction is raising some issues you you're solving an operational issue potentially maybe you're creating a safety issue that you need to to look at a little more carefully and and spend some time working through is there you know is there something we've missed or or do we need to do something different and so to me this is uh is often kind of the the real world complexity um of dealing with uh freeways weaves uh ramps um and there's even more that we could talk about but i think that that gets at those those issues so um, I guess I'm going to pause or even 
stop. I'm going to go back to the presentation. Hopefully you've been able to follow along generally. See if, yeah, I had two, two quick corrections. So I, I've, I've talked about this. I will go through these. How do the results change? And why is there an increase in certain types of crashes in the corridor? And so I'll, I'll go through those here quick. Give everybody a uh, quick answer, minute to answer. And then, um, yeah. So Beth, I'm, I'm watching the clock here. And I want to get, get this back over to you. Um, yeah. Yeah, so. Maybe we get through these real quick, take a short break, and then yeah. take it home. Yeah, in fact, I'm gonna just, uh, I'm gonna kind of scroll through this. I think we've already talked through these. And I do wanna, yeah, we do wanna keep it, keep things moving. And I think that was a lot of detail. Hopefully you were able to follow along. And Adam, you probably have some questions. I, I am inclined to just kind of go on to the last piece of this, just questions to think about. How did calibration factors affect the results? In this case, they didn't. They were not part of it. We don't have them for freeways and other factors. Things should be considered that were not considered. And why do you agree or disagree with the results? And how could the build project be modified to reduce the high severity crashes? So those are important uh, important things to, to think through um, with every project. So but with that, I, I'm actually, that's the end. Um, and I can leave these, uh, Yeah, the Mentimeter going, but I, I think we'll take a maybe a five or five minute break, and uh, and then come back and do the key takeaways from this module, and then um, do our next module. All right, and then that last one is the scoping. Yep. All right, so so we'll reconvene at four. Four o'clock. Yes, four o'clock, three fifty-five. So five-minute break, reconvene, and then just wrap up. And yeah, the scoping we we uh, we will still end. Uh, I think a little bit early. Yes. All right. Talk to y'all in a minute. All right. Well, we will get going again. Um, starting with our sort of takeaways from. <clears throat> talking about the predictive method. Uh, so first and foremost, there, there are the four kind of buckets of analysis, right? The SPFs, crash modification factors, um, which will be called, as we've mentioned, adjustment factors. Uh, adding your calibration factor, if when available, and then the EB when appropriate, which we, you know, have hopefully conveyed for the alternatives investigation, it may not be appropriate very often for the purposes of identifying whether or not um, a, a site or a project should be a primary need and the purpose of need, then EB may be appropriate pretty often. Um, lots of resources. So there's FDOT, HSM spreadsheets, the SPICE tool, um, there are calibration factors available from the website. And then there's different models, IHSDM, the ISAT E tool that you were just working in, and then the HSM spreadsheets. And as, um, as we, it looks like our links aren't necessarily working, but as we mentioned, especially if you're gonna be, well, in all cases, you know, if you're pulling spreadsheets off of a website, it's probably good to always start with an original rather than picking something out of your files just in case there's been updates. And documentation, critical piece, as hopefully you've determined. Um, and these, this list looks just like other lists you've seen. What were your data, your methods, your results? Um, an assessment, you should talk about the sort of the scope and methods in your work, the tools you use, any particular caveats. I think that, um, some sort of tabular sum summary of those high level assumptions that really you know, set the direction of the analysis should be documented for sure. And then think about and compare and contrast the results. 